In 2017, a strange object was spotted in our solar system. It had the shape of a long tube, similar to a pancake. No known asteroid or comet we've seen looks like that. Its exterior was also peculiar. It was at least 10 times more reflective than the average stuff that flies through space, with some saying it had a surface similar to polished metal. When it went past the Sun and left our reach, it accelerated faster than what our gravity could account for. At first glance, it was like this thing had a rocket strapped to its back. This unusual visitor even got a special name, a muamua. It comes from Hawaiian and translates to scout or visitor from a faraway land. And because of its characteristics, scientists soon began to wonder if this was at last a visit from otherworldly creatures. Before they went full on with the science fiction suppositions, Astronomers gathered the information they were sure about, starting with the fact that Oumuamua must have come from another solar system. There must have been some unfortunate event in its home system that led to its ejection. What they didn't know was that this was a comet or asteroid. They're both celestial objects orbiting a sun, but they have distinct compositions and behaviors. Comets are composed primarily of ice, dust, and rocky material, often referred to as dirty snowballs. When a comet approaches the Sun, the heat causes the ice to vaporize, releasing gas and dust particles into space. This creates a bright glowing tail that can extend for millions of miles. Comets generally have elliptical orbits, often taking them from the distant reaches of our solar system closer to the Sun. Asteroids, however, are mostly made of rock and metal. In our neighborhood, they are remnants of the early formation of the solar system and are typically found in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Unlike comets, asteroids do not develop tails when they approach the Sun, as they have no ice. Their orbits generally follow more circular paths compared to comets. By all accounts, Oumuamua should be a comet, because it seems to come from a different location in the universe. Yet, it doesn't exhibit the typical signs of cometary activity. Oumuamua lacks a tail and does not spew out gas as it passes by, not like me. Even though it behaves like a comet, it looks more like an asteroid. Now, another big question is how scientists even managed to spot Oumuamua in the first place. Considering the vastness of space and time in the galaxy, it's remarkable. Stars have lifetimes spanning millions or billions of years and the formation of a solar system takes hundreds of millions of years. Even the fastest objects take tens of thousands of years to travel from one star to another. In contrast, humans have only been observing the skies with telescopes for around 400 years, a tiny fraction of cosmic time. And it's only in recent decades, even years, that we've had the technology to detect and track fast-moving, dim objects. Either rocks like these are abundant, or we've been incredibly lucky with our detections. Or it's simply wanted to be seen. Now another question that was asked was where such objects could come from. It's highly unlikely that Oumuamua came from a mature, stable solar system. That's because such systems don't eject enough material to fill up the galaxy. Occasionally, a random rock might get flung out but it can rarely travel so far. Young systems, however, act differently. In these chaotic environments, collisions, mergers, and migrations are happening everywhere. Plenty of tiny rocks roam around, perfect candidates for ejection. The solar system that kicked Oumuamua out must have had a planet similar to Jupiter. Its massive size and gravity could influence other objects in the system, causing potential ejections. But not all solar systems develop Jupiter-sized planets. Often, massive planets end up close to their stars, becoming hotter versions of Jupiter. These planets, snugly orbiting a sun, are less likely to eject debris. Now, Neptune-like planets may play a role too. While not as massive as Jupiter, they tend to call the outer regions of solar systems their home. Our solar system has the Kuiper Belt, a reservoir of comets in its outer reaches. During a solar system's early stages, interactions between Neptune-like planets and debris are common. Finding Neptune-like planets in other systems has been challenging, though. Our methods for detecting exoplanets work better for massive objects close to their stars, making it difficult to spot Neptune counterparts farther out. 
Oumuamua was also linked to a peculiar theory about how life came to be in the universe – panspermia. Now that's a hypothesis that suggests that life exists throughout the universe and can be distributed between planets by various means, such as asteroids, comets, or even spacecraft. It says that life must have originated in one location in the universe and then spread to other celestial bodies. Fans of the panspermia theory have suggested that such interstellar objects could potentially carry tiny microbes, those building blocks of life between star systems. If such objects were to impact a planet or a moon, they could transfer these materials and seed the celestial body with life. For now, there is no evidence to support the theory that this comet in particular has transported life between star systems. After years of research, the overall consensus became that Oumuamua was indeed a comet. The reason why it moves so strangely is because it might have frozen hydrogen on its surface that reacts when touched by sunlight. The closer it got to our sun, the faster it became, releasing that hydrogen and also changing its path to our solar system. Its color also supports this theory. It's red, which might mean it's been hit by cosmic rays for a long time. The longer it was touched by those rays, the more hydrogen it gathered in the process. But since they can't be completely sure, astronomers have a plan to follow this visitor. One idea is to send a mission to check it out. It's already far away from us, but it may not be too late just yet. We may be able to send a probe fast enough to catch up with the comet. The plan was named Project Lyra and aims to use the Earth's orbit and that of Jupiter to bounce out a probe far enough to reach Oumuamua. If it works, it will be the fastest space device we've sent out in the universe. One potential trajectory of the space probe involves the gravitational pull of our planet and that of Jupiter as a lasso effect, but not Ted Lasso. The probe will leave our planet and re-enter Earth's orbit before sending it to meet with Jupiter's pull. It will be sent back near our planet a second time, where it will be ejected with enough force to reach the comet. Project Lyra also aims to follow a second faraway visitor named Borisov. This one was discovered by an amateur astronomer and now bears his name. What's interesting about it is that it's, well, spotless. Similar to our experience with Oumuamua, we haven't seen anything like Borisov before either. Studies of the light coming from its cloud of dust and gas show it's very clean compared to other space objects. After it was first noticed in August 2019, astronomers studied its path through our solar system and concluded it came from another star too. But Borisov gave us more time to study it because we spotted it earlier in its journey through our neighborhood. Researchers used advanced telescopes to look at the dust coming off Borisov they found is throwing off over 400 pounds of dust every second. They also found Borisov has more carbon monoxide than comets from our solar system usually do. But the amount isn't the same everywhere on the comet. This tells us the space object probably started forming near its home star before moving away, maybe because of larger planets in its system. The light from Borisov is way more polarized than light from other comets we've seen, and its cloud is super smooth. This tells us Borisov has never interacted with another star. So, we might be getting closer to finding a massive icy planet beyond Neptune's orbit. Yeah, sorry Pluto, still not you. Recently, some universe mapping using data from a telescope in Hawaii eliminated about 78% of the possible locations for this mysterious Waldo from space. Some people call it Planet 9, while others prefer Planet X. Either way, it's been causing controversy since its existence was first proposed. And that is mainly because no study so far can answer the big question – does it really exist? If discovered, Planet 9 would rank as the fifth largest planet in our solar system, with a mass 10 times that of Earth. It's also theorized to be gaseous, like Uranus. The initial study on Planet 9, dating back to 2016, suggests that this colossal new planet orbits the Sun 29 times farther out than Neptune, which sits at about 2.8 billion miles. As a result, 
the planet 9 would take between 10,000 and 20,000 years to complete a single orbit around the Sun. If confirmed, this yet-to-be-understood world would dominate a region larger than any other known planet in our cosmic neighborhood. These are all intriguing hypotheses, but without a single piece of evidence or observation to back them up. Before dismissing this as a wild guess, it is important to note that these researchers relied on complex mathematical modeling and computer simulations to speculate about the planet's characteristics, because that's what they do. The hypothetical presence of this planet would explain various mysterious features located beyond Neptune. We are specifically talking about the Kuiper Belt, a huge donut-shaped region filled with icy debris left over from the formation of the solar system, including comets and dwarf planets like Pluto. What happens is that the six farthest objects in the Kuiper Belt exhibit elliptical orbits that are all oriented in a similar direction within physical space and tilted approximately 30 degrees downward relative to the orbital plane of our eight known planets. What's strange here is that, despite their distinct orbital velocities around the solar system, they maintain this alignment. The likelihood of such alignment occurring randomly is extremely low, around 0.007%. So here comes Planet 9, a hypothetical massive celestial body that offers a plausible explanation for this strange phenomenon, potentially exerting gravitational influence to shape these orbits. The initial theory didn't hold up for long, facing accusations of observational bias and calculation errors. Then, in 2017, another study popped up, sparking back the idea that maybe Planet 9 is out there after all. This time, Spanish astronomers tried a novel approach, focusing on observing extreme trans-Neptunian objects. These celestial bodies orbit the Sun in highly stretched elliptical paths, with average distances exceeding 13 billion miles. The research suggests that the distances between these objects' nodes and the Sun might provide clues to Planet 9's location. You see, these nodes are the points where a celestial body's orbit intersects the solar system's plane. When these objects reach these points, they're more likely to interact with other solar system bodies, potentially causing significant changes in their orbits or even collisions. So, if the trajectory of these extreme trans-Neptunian objects remains stable, everything's fine. But if it's not, well, that's a sign that something else, something big, is messing with their path. And that's exactly what the research found. There is something unseen out there, throwing these objects off course. And that something could be a planet chilling at a distance between 300 to 400 times farther from the Sun than Earth. To this day, the study of the extreme trans-Neptunian objects is the strongest evidence we've got for Planet 9's existence. And if you're still not convinced by this theory, know that strange motions like these have led to planetary discoveries before. Neptune, for instance, was spotted because Uranus's motion didn't quite agree with the predictions of Newtonian gravity. But the deflection of its orbit could be explained if it was caused by a pull of an undiscovered planet. And just like that, we discovered Neptune. Now, the year is 2021, and there's all this buzz about Planet 9 again. After correcting some old guesses, studies are now leaning towards the idea that this mystery world follows an epic loop around the Sun every 7,000 years. That is massive news, because it means this planet might be closer than we ever thought, making it easier for our telescopes to spot it. The paper also suggests there is a whopping 99% chance that the funky orbits of these distant objects are all because of this unseen planet, not just some cosmic coincidence. Now, the odds of this whole situation being a fluke are down to a 1 in 250 chance, which is much better than the 1 in 10,000 chance back in 2016. All these optimistic numbers have brought us to where we are today keeping our hopes and working on better equipment to continue the mission of spotting Planet 9. As mentioned earlier, researchers in Hawaii created some kind of treasure map utilizing the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System to eliminate 78% of its locations. This is great news, 
considering how challenging it is to find a planet-sized needle in a cosmic haystack. But unfortunately, Planet Nine's presence remains a ghost in the dark outer reaches of our solar system. Enthusiasts are still convinced of its existence and believe it is only a matter of time before we celebrate the discovery of Earth's new cosmic cousin. They're putting their hopes on the Verici Rubin Observatory, which is currently under construction in Chile and is scheduled to begin science operations in late 2025. Over the course of 10 years, this observatory will scan the entire southern hemisphere sky every few nights with a 27-foot, fast-moving telescope equipped with the largest digital camera in the world. The idea is to catalog everything in the solar system, reaching out to and beyond Neptune and tracking the movements of millions of celestial objects, including space junk, asteroids, comets, and stars. If Planet 9 is indeed out there, this next-generation telescope could be the one to find it. The existence of this mysterious planet is far from being universally accepted in the scientific community. That is simply because Planet 9 isn't the only explanation for the strange phenomenon occurring beyond Neptune. One theory suggests that a group of distant objects, such as dwarf planets, comets, and moons, might be collectively influencing the orbits of the extreme trans-Neptunian objects. Others believe that a black hole is behind all this. These compressed masses are some of the densest objects in the universe, potentially capable of affecting the orbits of other masses, like how this supposed ghost planet 9 is believed to be doing. Another bold perspective suggests that our current understanding of the laws of gravity is flawed, actually incomplete. This theory, known as modified Newtonian dynamics, proposes that these distant icy objects exhibit strange behavior not due to influence from another planet, but rather because the immense gravitational field of the Milky Way is influencing them. However, even supporters of this theory acknowledge that it is too early to draw firm conclusions, and much more extensive research is still required. While we continue our relentless hunt for Planet 9, some astronomers have taken it a step further, suggesting the existence of a hypothetical Planet 10. This world has a mass and size like that of Mars or Earth and is located on the edges of the Kuiper Belt. But the thing is, if this alleged Planet 10 is indeed as small as scientists believe, it might not have enough gravity to clear its orbit of debris. And that is pretty similar to what happens with Pluto, being one of the reasons why it got into trouble back in 2006. So yeah, it's better not to get too excited. This supposed Planet 10 might end up classified as another dwarf planet. Earth's magnetic field hides a fascinating story. It turns out that it's getting weaker day by day. In fact, it's been doing so for the last 3,000 years. And if this trend continues, we could be in for some trouble within a millennium. What's the big deal? Well, picture this. Magnetic north becomes south, and vice versa. Pretty wild, right? When this happens, our planet's protective magnetic shield might weaken allowing more cosmic rays to hit us. These high-energy particles from the universe can cause electronic malfunctions in our satellites and produce elements that could be harmful to us. The last time a polarity reversal occurred was between 772,000 and 774,000 years ago. Thankfully, humanity has some pretty smart people on the case who are investigating the history of Earth's magnetic field. They take cores of sediments from the seafloor and study the magnetization of fossils to figure out when these reversals occurred in the past and when they might happen again. Another group of researchers is studying the South Atlantic Anomaly (SAA), a vast region of Earth's magnetic field that is about three times weaker than the field at the poles. Using data from multiple satellites, they are trying to figure out what's causing the SAA and how it might change in the future. This could give us a glimpse into how a weakened magnetic field can affect our satellites and our planet. Sure, our generation won't be here to witness these changes, but it does make you wonder what that planet might look like upside down. Magnetically, that is. 
NASA's astronomers have also announced that in 4 billion years, the Milky Way galaxy is going to get a major glow up. After a cosmic collision that will shake things up, I'm not talking about a small fender bender here, I'm talking about a titanic collision with our neighboring Andromeda galaxy. Humanity will have to hold on to its space helmet for this one because the sun might get flung into a new region of the galaxy. However, our Earth and solar system probably won't be seriously affected. Sounds difficult to believe, so how come? NASA's Hubble Space Telescope did some hardcore measurements of Andromeda's motion. Although the galaxies will plow into each other, the stars inside each galaxy are so far apart that they won't collide with other stars during the encounter. However, the stars will be thrown into different orbits around their new galactic centers. According to simulations, our solar system will probably be tossed much farther from the galactic core than it is today. Set your telescopes aside, you don't need to start counting down the years. This event is likely scheduled in about 4 billion years, so chances for us to witness it are zero. Saturn is losing its rings. Thankfully, we won't be here to witness this sad event either. Apparently, the rings are being pulled into Saturn as a dusty rain of ice particles, all under the influence of Saturn's magnetic field. According to NASA's research, the ring rain is draining an amount of water products that could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool from Saturn's rings every half an hour. The entire ring system will likely be gone in 300 million years. Scientists believe we should consider ourselves lucky to witness Saturn's ring system at all, as it seems to be in the middle of its lifetime. But if you think about it that way, that rings around planets are all temporary, there's a chance we've just missed out on the giant ring system of Jupiter, or those of Uranus and Neptune. These planets have only thin ringlets around them these days. Scientists have long debated whether Saturn was formed together with its rings or if the planet acquired them later in life. The new research favors the second scenario indicating that they are unlikely to be older than 100 million years, while Saturn itself is around 4.5 billion years old. What caused the rings to appear in the first place? Well, there are a few theories. One of them suggests the rings could have formed when small, icy moons in orbit around Saturn collided. Perhaps their own orbits were messed up by a gravitational tug from a passing asteroid or comet. Who knows what humans might end up looking like in the future? It's unlikely we'll see any major changes in our lifetime. But let's take a journey to the future and ponder what we might evolve into. Will we become cyborgs with all sorts of cool machine implants? Or maybe we'll become a hybrid species of biological and artificial beings? To understand our future evolution, we gotta take a peek at our past. A million years ago, Homo sapiens didn't even exist. There were a few other similar species though, like the Neanderthal. Fast forward to today, and humans have become taller and sturdier. Maybe in the future we'll become smaller to conserve energy, as it's predicted that our planet will get more crowded. Speaking of crowded planets, living in these new conditions means we have to adapt, and fast. We're constantly interacting with lots of people, and remembering names is becoming a crucial skill. Luckily, technology might help us out with brain implants that will improve our memory. In the future, we might also have more noticeable technologies as part of our appearance. Imagine having an artificial eye with a camera that can read different frequencies of light. While predicting a million years into the future is pure speculation, we can use bioinformatics to make some predictions about the immediate future. Demographic trends suggest that urban areas will become more genetically diverse, while rural areas will become less diverse. And what about space? If we end up colonizing Mars, our bodies could change due to lower gravity. Maybe we'll have longer arms and legs, or even insulating body hair like our Neanderthal cousins. 
In the future, our moon is also going to witness some dramatic changes. We'll miss these ones too. In about 5 billion years, things are going to get really interesting in this corner of the universe. For now, the sun is chilling in its main sequence phase, just burning hydrogen like nobody's business. In the future, during the red giant phase, the sun is going to puff up like a balloon until its atmosphere reaches out and engulfs our beloved Earth and Moon. Our natural satellite, which is already moving away from Earth, is going to get warped around the sun's influence. Its orbit will get all wonky, and it'll end up closer to Earth during the new moon phase than during the full moon. And that's not even the worst part. If left alone, the moon would keep on moving away from Earth until it'll need almost 50 days to orbit us. As the sun continues with its own journey, its atmosphere will drag on the moon and cause its orbit to decay. Eventually, the moon will get torn apart into a stunning ring of debris circling Earth. We're talking about all its mountains, craters, and even the footprints and flags we left there, all scattered throughout the debris field. There's a chance the sun will shed enough mass to spare Earth and the moon from total annihilation. Or if we're really lucky, the sun will lose 20% of its mass and we'll be safe and sound. It's all just theory right now, we haven't seen a red giant star during this phase. The universe itself might go completely dark one day too. Scientists can't predict it with absolute certainty, but they can make some educated guesses. Right now, our universe is 13.77 billion years old, and it's still churning out new stars left and right. It's said that eventually, after about 1 trillion years, the last star will be born. That final star will be a little guy, a red dwarf, just a fraction the size of our sun. These stars are champs at living long lives, slowly sipping on hydrogen to keep their fusion reactions going. But even they can't last forever. Fast forward about 100 trillion years and the last light will go out. The universe will be dark and lonely, but thankfully we won't be here to watch it all fade away. If an asteroid like Apophis hits Earth, we will be destroyed. Massive earthquakes will strike. And tsunamis will flood everything. Apophis is a billion-year-old celestial body that has been in the solar system since its inception. So you might be thinking, well, how likely is it that this giant space stone will collide with our planet in 2029? Well, let's find out, shall we? Apophis is a big, bad asteroid discovered in 2004 by the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona. Since then, it has proudly held the title of one of the most dangerous asteroids ever located. It's around 1,100 feet wide, which is a bit bigger than the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower. Because of how scary it is, it was named Apophis, like the Egyptian immortal creature that was considered to bring eternal darkness and destruction to Earth. Oh boy! In 2021, researchers had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study this floating rock when it passed near our planet. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, some scientists say that there is a small chance of Apophis hitting the Earth on Friday, April 13, 2029. The Yarkovsky effect is to blame for this, since it can slightly nudge this space rock towards Earth. This effect originates from the uneven emission of thermal photons from a rotating celestial object, resulting in a fascinating force exerted upon it in space. These emitted photons possess momentum and play a pivotal role in shaping the dynamics of the body. The asteroid has two sides, light and dark, just like the moon. The light side faces the sun and is warmer than the dark side. But the thing also turns, so the sides constantly change direction and temperature. This change could be detrimental because it slightly pushes Apophis toward Earth. Unfortunately, nobody knows how the Yakovsky effect will influence the asteroid's path. On the other hand, on the asteroid's last flyby of Earth in 2021, 
Astronomers use radar to take accurate measurements of its trajectory and confidently concluded Apophis will safely miss Earth in 2029 by about 20,000 miles and won't bother us again for at least 100 years. Now, generally speaking, every 8,000 years, our planet is hit by a falling star that has similar dimensions to those of Apophis. The last time we were hit by a slightly smaller meteor was in 2013. A new spacecraft developed by NASA called the OSIRIS-REx was launched in 2016 to collect samples from another slightly less terrifying celestial body called Bennu. Four years later, it finally arrived at the thing, got some samples, quickly said goodbye to Bennu, and started traveling back towards Earth. The samples were safely stored in a capsule dropped in Utah. So far, this has been the most significant sample ever taken from an asteroid. After the delivery, the spacecraft didn't waste any time and started chasing Apophis. Now, OSIRIS-REx has been renamed to OSIRIS-APEX and is currently playing tag with Apophis. With some luck, on the 2nd of April 2029, when the asteroid zips close by Earth, the spacecraft will reach Apophis and land on it. It will stay on Apophis for 18 months collecting valuable information and taking thousands of pictures. The asteroid will be monitored with the help of powerful telescopes. At some point, Apophis will get too close to the Sun, and then all the monitoring work will be on Osiris's apex back. If you live in Europe, West Asia, or Africa, you're one of those lucky people who will have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see Apophis with the unaided eye. It'll be visible in the sky in these regions in 2029, and those who have telescopes will be able to spot it once again in 2036. Osiris Apex will experience some problems because the asteroid has a thick crust, and the spacecraft won't be able to collect data as easily as it did with Bennu. Osiris Apex has a unique thruster that will blow all the dust from Apophis while landing. This will be a perfect chance to analyze the surface of the asteroid to see what it's made of. The craft will spend one and a half years mapping the asteroid, trying to detect changes in its shape. All this research will show how the celestial body is likely to move so we can better design plans to protect Earth from such things. In 2025, NASA is also going to launch the mission Apophis Pathfinder, and it will be the first spaceship to ever touch this asteroid. It will land approximately a year after its launch. Also, NASA has proposed sending a swarm of tiny craft into space to help humanity develop effective protective tactics against asteroid strikes. We know that Apophis originated in the primary asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. In the past million years, this celestial body has changed its path because of the considerable influence of Jupiter's gravitation. Now it seems like it favors the Sun more, meaning this asteroid will come very close to Earth. That's why it's classified as a near-Earth celestial body. A lot of tests and research have been done to find a way to deal with asteroids. Some solutions include drilling and detonating the space body from inside, or testing new technologies, like attaching rockets to it and trying to steer it away from Earth. We can also hit it with something moving at high speeds to make it change its course. Apophis is an S-type asteroid made of rocks and minerals like iron and nickel, and is shaped like a peanut. It can tell us a lot about the past and possibly the future. Sampling this space object could reveal how life on Earth began and how plants appeared. There are many theories that suggest that water arrived on our planet on an asteroid or a comet. Asteroids are like priceless time capsules. Unlike rocks on Earth, which have undergone thousands of changes, like erosion, most celestial bodies are still intact and much easier to study. When meteors fall on Earth, they get covered in debris that's impossible to clean. That's why studying Apophis while it's still in space is so important. Also, some asteroids are made of precious metals like platinum. Right now, we have a high demand for metals that we use in production, and mining metals on Earth is quite tricky. Just one large meteor might have iron, nickel, gold, and platinum that could last us millions of years. 
If a pulpus has this amount of metals, well, we'd want to break it down and bring it back to Earth. One space rock could be worth quadrillions of dollars, making space mining highly profitable. And still, it would cost us more to get it back to Earth than to dig up these materials here. As technology progresses and new kinds of rockets are developed, this might become possible at some point. So, even though we're safe for the next 100 years from Apophis, you probably still want to see what would happen if something like it did impact. Come on, sure you do. Well, first let me tell you, you'll hear the sound of the collision and know what's happened even if you're miles away. You should leave your house or apartment immediately. Shortly after the impact, massive earthquakes will strike, and many tall buildings will fall. So staying away from cities might be your best option if you have a choice. But don't escape by car. There will be massive traffic jams, and everyone will panic. Going on foot or by bike is your best option in this scenario. A prime way of transportation will be traveling by plane. So if you've always wanted to get that pilot license, now you've got a good excuse. If you have time, take along extra snacks and water and an extra pair of socks. It's nice to live by the ocean or the sea, but in this scenario, it's the worst place to be because giant tsunami waves will hit coastlines after the impact. If you live far away from the impact area, the tsunami might take 30 hours to arrive. You'll have a bit of time to prepare. The James Webb Telescope, or JWST, is like the ultimate intergalactic paparazzi. It takes pictures of some of the most famous celebrities in the universe. Stars, galaxies, exoplanets, you name it. The James Webb Space Telescope will snap a photo. So if you're a fan of cosmic celebrities, let's take a look at some of these best star-studded photos. The Carina Nebula. The image of the nebula with the beautiful name Carina was published on July 12th. JWST captured a beautiful view of the nebula, located about 7,500 light years from Earth. Nicknamed the Cosmic Cliffs, it is, in fact, a hotbed of young stars, some of which are several times larger than our Sun. The Carina Nebula is a celestial spectacle located in the southern constellation Carina. It's really huge, approximately 260 light years across. Massive stars within this nebula are so bright and hot that they create a glowing cloud of gas and dust around them. The Carina Nebula also contains swirling clouds of gas and dust where new stars are being born. The gas collapses under its own weight, becomes hotter and denser, and all this eventually leads to the creation of new stars. However, the Carina Nebula isn't just some peaceful place of star formation. It's the site of some of the most destructive events in the universe, which create massive shockwaves that obliterate everything in their path. Very chaotic and cool. The Stefan's Quintet. This photo was also posted on July 12th. Stefan's Quintet is a visual group of five galaxies located at a huge distance from us, about 290 million light years in the constellation of Pegasus. It's like a cosmic family reunion. All these galaxies are related to each other and interact with each other in some interesting ways. They're pulling and tugging on each other with their gravity, constantly exchanging gas and dust. This interaction is causing some of the galaxies to collide and merge, which can create all sorts of cool effects, like bursts of star formation and supernovae. Thanks to JWST, we were able to see shockwaves, tidal tails, and other amazing details about these galaxies. Their interactions create a stunning sight that we can see in this photo. Jupiter. And here's our old giant friend. This image was published by NASA on August 22nd. Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system, and it's known for its many moons and its beautiful swirling clouds. But it also has a system of rings, just like Saturn, which are made up of tiny particles of dust that orbit the planet. 
These rings are much smaller and less visible than Saturn's, but they're still pretty neat. Jupiter also has auroras, which are colorful light displays that occur in the planet's atmosphere. They're caused by charged particles from the solar wind interacting with Jupiter's magnetic field. Just like on Earth, they can be seen near the poles of the planet. But these auroras are much brighter and more intense than ours. We can even see this crazy light show from space. And now, we were finally able to capture this dazzling sight. JWST's photo shows the auroras of Jupiter, its rings, and even two moons, Amalthea and Adrastea. It's amazing how bright and clear they are on this photo. The Cartwheel Galaxy NASA released this image on August 2nd. This photo shows us the Cartwheel Galaxy and its companions. The Cartwheel Galaxy gets its name from its shape. It kind of looks like a cartwheel, doesn't it? This is a giant swirling mass of stars, gas, and dust, which is located in the depths of space. It's shaped like a pinwheel with long spiral arms. These arms are held together by the gravity of the central region, which is home to a supermassive black hole. But the Cartwheel Galaxy is a bit different from its spiral relatives. It has formed when a smaller galaxy collided with a larger one creating a shockwave that rippled through the gas and dust. We'll definitely have to visit this galaxy someday. It's sure to be a wild ride. Spiral Galaxy M74 And here comes another spiral galaxy. NASA released this image on July 22nd. JWST had to peer through thick layers of dust and gas to see this beautiful star cluster. M74 belongs to a special class of spiral galaxies known as the Grand Design Galaxy. This means that its spiral arms are noticeable and clearly outlined. All sorts of amazing things are happening inside of spiral galaxies. Supernovas, stars being born in clouds of gas and dust, and many other cosmic wonders. The glowing gas and dust the bright stars and the swirling patterns of the spiral arms make them some of the most striking objects in the universe. Well, we can clearly see it on the example of M74. The Tarantula Nebula This image of the nebula with a creepy name Tarantula was published on September 6th. The photo covers as much as 340 light years across. This is a huge distance! Thanks to this image, astronomers have discovered new young stars that were previously shrouded in dust. The Tarantula Nebula is located 160,000 light years away from us, in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's the largest and brightest star forming region in the local group, the galaxies nearest our Milky Way. It's named after its shape, which looks like a bit like the legs of a big tarantula. It's a vast region of space, about 1,000 light years across, and it's home to some of the most massive and luminous stars in the universe. One of the reasons why the Tarantula Nebula is interesting to scientists is its composition. Its composition is close to the region of stars of the cosmic noon, the so-called state of our universe when it was only a few billion years old. At that time, star formation was at its peak. Thanks to the Webb Telescope, we can study this galaxy better and find out what our universe was like at its peak. Neptune's Rings This photo was published on September 21, 2022. In this photo, we can even see six small moons next to the planet, with Triton shining brightly in the upper left corner. You didn't think it was the Sun, did you? And yep, Neptune has rings too! They're like the ultimate cosmic accessory. They add a touch of glamour and style to the planet. But unlike some earthly bling, these rings are made of small particles of dust rather than diamonds and gold. There are five known rings around Neptune. The Gaul, Le Verrier, La Celle, Arago, and Adam's rings. Scientists think that these are relatively young, much younger than our solar system and much younger than, for example, Uranus's rings. They were probably created when one of Neptune's inner moons got too close to the planet and was torn apart by gravity. 
we haven't seen Neptune's ring so brightly since Voyager 2 flew past it back in 1989. So this is a great opportunity to take a closer look at these rings. The Pillars of Creation This photo was published on October 19. The Pillars of Creation became famous thanks to the Hubble telescope, but this photo is very lush and much more detailed. These columns, located in the Eagle Nebula, are about 5 light years tall, which is really, really long. And they look like some majestic rock formations, only much more transparent. Just like a typical Hollywood movie set, they're full of action and special effects. They're home to some of the most dramatic processes in the universe. The gas and dust are collapsing under their own gravity, forming clumps that will eventually become stars. The place is full of intense radiation, jets of high-energy particles, and supernovae. It's like a cosmic version of Survivor. And if this wasn't creepy enough, here's another photo published by NASA on October 19th. They shared it right before Halloween. Here, the pillars resemble an eerie hand reaching for something. Brr. Anyway, all these photos give us a truly awe-inspiring sight. They remind us of the incredible complexity of the universe and the amazing things that are happening even in the darkest and most remote corners of the cosmos. Let's hope that the James Webb Telescope will continue to amaze us in the future. The Hubble Space Telescope was put into a low Earth orbit in 1990. If you think about it, it's had over 30 years of experience looking at various space objects. It was named after astronomer Edwin Hubble and was built by NASA. It is also part of a group of devices called NASA's Great Observatories, along with the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and the Spitzer Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope was built to explore the universe and answer some of its biggest questions, such as how galaxies form and evolve, and how the universe itself has changed over time. The telescope has made many important discoveries including providing evidence of the existence of dark matter and helping to determine the rate of expansion of the universe. One of the most famous images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope is the Pillars of Creation. It's a photo of a region of the Eagle Nebula, where new stars are born. The photo, which was taken in 1995, shows massive pillars of gas and dust towering above the nebula. It has become one of the most iconic images of the universe. The Hubble Space Telescope continues to operate and make important scientific discoveries, despite some initial technical difficulties. In 1993, a problem with the telescope's main mirror was discovered, which affected its ability to focus light properly. A repair mission was sent to the telescope in 1994 to fix the problem, and since then, the telescope has continued to work perfectly. One of the more interesting discoveries made by this amazing telescope is actually pretty recent. A report based on the data from the Hubble Space Telescope shows that there is a faint glow in space around the solar system that cannot be explained by anything we know to exist. Because they have yet to figure out the source, astronomers call this mysterious glow ghost light. We don't know that this light is not coming from the stars or galaxies near the solar system, nor is it coming from dust on the solar system's plane. The researchers aren't sure what the source of the light is, but they think it might be tiny particles of dust and ice left by comets. But it's only a theory that has not yet been confirmed. When we study the universe, we often find bright things like planets, stars, and galaxies. But from time to time, we discover some light coming from places where we didn't expect to see it, like from between planets. This light may be coming from deep within our solar system, and it may be a new phenomenon that hasn't been studied before. In other words, there may be something at the center of our galaxy that produces a lot of light. Spacecraft Voyager 1 also captured images showing a lot of light coming from the edge of our solar system. How come we haven't noticed this until now? Well, because most of the light in pictures taken by the Hubble telescope comes from things close to Earth. But people usually ignore this light because they're interested in things like stars and galaxies that are farther away. We've never actually looked closely at the amount of light in the universe and where it comes from. 
Scientists have been using the Hubble to find faint galaxies that may have been missed before and which may be the source of this dim glow. They found that there are not enough such galaxies to account for extra light in the sky. It's not a lot of light, though. It's like the glow from 10 fireflies. But it doesn't make it less important. It shows that we may be missing something. Let's look at some other important discoveries we've made with the help of Hubble. Like dark matter, which we can't see but know is there because of its effect on gravity. It makes up for about 23% of the universe. By looking at how it affects light, the Hubble telescope helped make 3D maps of where dark matter is. These maps show that dark matter seems to be getting clumpier over time, which means it behaves very similarly to how gravity does. The Hubble telescope also discovered two new moons around Pluto, named Nix and Hydra, and studied the dwarf planet's changing surface. Additionally, it's found the mass of planet Eris, which is larger than Pluto. This helps scientists realize there may be similar objects in the Kuiper Belt, a region outside our solar system. This led to Pluto being reclassified as a dwarf planet. Further observations of these distant objects could help us understand the evolution of our solar system. Gamma-ray bursts are the most powerful explosions in the universe, and for a long time, no one knew where they had been coming from. Hubble helped us find out that these bursts happen in galaxies, producing a lot of stars and having few heavy elements. This suggests that gamma-ray bursts happen when big stars collapse into black holes. These galaxies have lots of big stars that fall apart quickly, and the stars there don't have much heavy stuff, so they can turn into black holes. In 1994, the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet collided with Jupiter. Hubble captured the whole event in detail, like a resourceful journalist. The impact broke the comet into a lot of small pieces, which resulted in 21 other visible collisions. The largest impact created a fireball and a dark spot on Jupiter's surface. Hubble's observations not only sparked public interest in cosmic impacts, but also provided new insights into Jupiter's atmosphere. To move forward with our list of discoveries made by the Hubble telescope, we also need to talk about black holes. There are points in space where gravity has so much force that even light cannot escape it. The gravity becomes so strong that matter gets squeezed into a very small space. We know that this can happen when a star, like the Sun, nears the end of its life. At the beginning of its life, a star's hydrogen ignites in its dense hot core. Because of gravity, it tries to draw its own mass into a tiny point. As long as it has the energy generated by the hydrogen fusion, it also pushes outward. If we look at it this way, the life of a star depends on a delicate balance between these forces, and it can last millions or even billions of years. Once that energy is exhausted, the only force remaining is that of gravity. So, some stars become black holes. Since light itself cannot escape its pull, we can't visualize black holes. For the human eye, they are invisible. We need special tools and unique telescopes to help us point them out in the universe. Hubble found that most galaxies with a central bulge of stars likely have supermassive black holes. It also noticed a strong connection between the size of these black holes and their host galaxies, which might help us understand how the universe has changed over time. Then, what is a supermassive black hole, you might ask? Go ahead, ask it. It is a very large black hole that is typically found at the center of a galaxy. It is millions or even billions of times more massive than our Sun. These black holes are so powerful that they can swallow stars and even entire galaxies. Scientists are still exploring these mysterious objects, but they believe that they play a crucial role in the formation and evolution of galaxies. Now, before Hubble, we really didn't know how old the universe was. It often led to weird paradoxes, like the one where stars discovered by astronomers were older than the universe itself. But by figuring out the approximate rate at which the universe is expanding, Hubble helped us narrow down its age, which is about 13.75 billion years. Trying to figure out the exact age of the universe is an important question. That's because most astronomers think that the universe has not existed forever, 
but appeared in one really hot and dense fireball called the Big Bang. I wasn't around then. So, are you tired of boring old Earth? Want to know what lies beyond the starry night sky? You're not the only one. People have been asking the same question for centuries. Luckily, scientists have got you covered. They've discovered a lot of amazing places light years away from our blue planet. Just one light year is about 6 trillion miles. Mind blowing, huh? So, hop on! The spaceship of knowledge is lifting off. Your first stop is 2.5 billion light years away from Earth. It's a quasar, one of the brightest objects in the universe and the first one to be discovered. A quasar isn't a star, but a distant galaxy. This extremely bright object gets its power from a supermassive black hole. A disk of matter swirls around the black hole and creates friction. It's kind of like when you're cold and rub your hands together to stay warm. The friction between the palms creates heat, making you feel nice and cozy. The same happens in the quasar, just the amount of heat is bigger, way bigger. I hope you remember to pack sunscreen lotion. The temperature at the heart of this quasar can reach 18 trillion degrees Fahrenheit. Also, there is light, a lot of it. This celestial object shines a hundred times brighter than all the stars in its galaxy put together. Well, it's time to cool down a bit. Minus 457 degrees Fahrenheit, to be precise. This is the temperature of a young planetary nebula called the Boomerang Nebula. It sits 5,000 light years away from Earth. NASA's Hubble telescope caught images of the formation in 1998. It's composed of gas coming from a star near the end of its life cycle. Inside the nebula, it's windier than in the Windy City. Winds reach speeds up to 310,000 miles per hour. And you gotta thank them for the nebula's chilling temperatures. Researchers were just impressed to find out that the temperature of the Boomerang Nebula is just 1 degree above absolute zero. Zero Kelvin should be the coldest temperature possible. This is the point where all molecular and atomic activity stops. Brr! Makes you want to crank up the thermostat in your spaceship. Next, you're going to a place you might not want to visit. Sorry. So, it's the most massive black hole. This giant is located at the heart of a large galaxy some 10.4 billion light years from our planet. Its mass is 66 billion times greater than that of the Sun. Enough to make our galaxy's supermassive black hole feel ashamed. It has a mass of merely 4.5 million times that of the Sun. But you better not get near any of them, as a black hole's diet consists of matter. By calculating how much matter they consume, scientists can determine their rate of expansion. And those black holes have quite an appetite. Astronomers believe there are stupendously large black holes, or slabs, hiding somewhere in the universe. If they're real, their mass is estimated to be greater than 100 billion times that of the Sun. Now, it's time to snack on something lighter. The spaceship enters the Kepler-51 system. It's home to the lightest planets in the known universe, called superpuffs. Sounds fluffy enough, and it is. These planets' mass is either the same or slightly greater than that of Earth. But this doesn't mean they're small. Think of them as giant cotton candies the size of Jupiter. They are newly born planets whose atmosphere is still cooling down. You might want to wait for this process to be over, though, as 500 degrees Fahrenheit is too hot to handle. But for experts, super puffs are special. These planets are incredibly rare, as they've managed to discover less than 20 so far. Now, are you up for a race? Let's say the ship you're on is traveling at a speed of 25,000 miles per hour. This is the current human speed record. It was set by NASA's astronaut TRIO from the Apollo 10 mission in 1969. And no, I am not talking about Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. That was the Apollo 11 mission later that year. Right now, you're going to race against a star 18,000 light years from Earth. Your biggest advantage is that this is a neutron star. It was formed when another massive star ran out of nuclear fuel and couldn't support itself anymore. Think of a car running on an empty tank. Victory couldn't be any closer, right? Well, not quite. When a massive star feels like its time is up, it shrinks and starts spinning. Figure skaters do the same during a spin. 
they fold in their arms to increase rotation to the maximum. This neutron star is the champion of the universe. It spins at a speed of 157 million miles per hour. That's roughly 27% of the speed of light. Whoa! Are you running low on energy at this point? Time to charge up from a gamma ray burst. Gamma rays are electromagnetic waves generated by various forms of radiation. These bursts were fairly unknown to science until the late 1960s. Satellites equipped with gamma ray detectors accidentally recorded huge outbursts of radiation outside of our solar system. What were they? Nothing dark, definitely, as these are the most energetic forms of light. Scientists believe that gamma ray bursts happen when two neutron stars collide and form a black hole. The other explanation is that they are in the final stage in the life of a supernova. This event happens when a star decides to go out with a bang. Gamma ray bursts shine brighter than a diamond. They are a million trillion times brighter than the sun. Talk about an energy boost. Ah, your mood is lightened up by now. You want to visit a place that has a draw to it. No, it's not a beach resort, but a magnetar. It's a neutron star with a twist. Magnetars have a magnetic field that is a trillion times stronger than that on our planet. But don't fall for their strong appeal. Let's just say you won't live to tell a tale if you get too close to one. In 2004, a flare that came off the surface of a magnetar managed to compress Earth's magnetic field from a distance of 50,000 light years. Quite impressive for a star the size of a city. Makes you wish to team up with this oversized magnet to commit the greatest heist ever. A magnetar has the ability to swipe all the credit cards on planet Earth from a distance halfway to the moon. Luckily for humans, NASA has discovered only 31 of these stars so far. You have barely escaped the pull of a magnetar. Suddenly, you start to sense a strange force drawing you away from your home base. It is the Great Attractor, one of the biggest mysteries of the universe. This massive gravitational irregularity has been pulling us closer and closer to it for billions of years. Scientists estimate that the Great Attractor is located at the center of the Linnea Kea supercluster. The name means immeasurable heaven in Hawaiian. It represents a gigantic collection of planets, stars, and asteroids. Our home galaxy, the Milky Way, is just a speck in this enormous supercluster. According to the Big Bang Theory, not the TV show, the real theory, the universe has been expanding in all directions. But the mysterious Great Attractor is slowing things down. How exactly? Researchers still need to figure this one out. On the bright side, they are good at naming things the end of the universe would be called the Big Crunch, if there's anyone left to call it that. Your journey, too, ends at the edge of the universe. The most distant galaxy from Earth is the oldest one as well. The galaxies that form first after the Big Bang have drifted the furthest. So every time advanced telescopes detect a far, far away dot, they give scientists an image of the origins of the universe. Now really, an object weighing billions of times the mass of our sun must be easy to find, right? Wrong. Unfortunately, it might not be that simple. Like in the case with a missing black hole. But let's travel to the galaxy cluster Abel 2261, hosting a supermassive black hole at its center. Or at least, that's where it's supposed to be. The main problem is this giant space phenomenon is nowhere to be found. Now, supermassive black holes are mega-monsters, churning slowly at the center of their home galaxies. They gather tremendous clouds of gas and dust around them, which makes them swell up to sizes the human mind can't begin to imagine. If a supermassive black hole, like the one that dwells at the center of our home Milky Way galaxy, moved even a little bit closer to our solar system, we'd be doomed. The distance between this huge thing and Earth could be several dozens of light years, and still, it would wreak havoc on our planet. Earth, along with other things making up the solar system, would be tugged into the black hole's orbit and doomed to spin around it for eternity or longer. Hey, who knows, right? So, it's good that such black holes stay away from us at the moment. 
So let's see what happened to that runaway supermassive black hole from that gigantic cluster of galaxies around 2.7 billion years away from our planet. Scientists have been looking for it with the help of NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and Hubble Space Telescope. But so far, no result. The main problem with finding a black hole is that it's, uh, well, black. And space is, you guessed it, black too. So there's no contrast whatsoever that could help astronomers spot the hole. But scientists haven't given up yet. After all, they have a lot of other technologies to find black holes, small and big, in the vastness of space. Some of these methods involve watching the stars orbiting black holes. Sometimes it's a fake gravitational wave signal which is produced when two black holes collide. But the most reliable technique is watching dust and gas falling to their doom. The thing is, black holes are space objects with insane gravity. So regions of space surrounding them are usually a bit chaotic, gas and dust getting pulled into the bottomless abyss, compressing and heating up. In the process, it releases a flood of X-ray radiation. So astronomers look for extremely bright X-ray sources in the universe. Chances are those are the last gasps of giant clumps of material before they disappear into a black hole. Then, why can't scientists find such X-ray signatures left by the black hole in Abel 2261? One of the most mysterious things about its disappearance is that radio telescopes have spotted some signs of massive plumes of superheated material launched at one point within the last 50 million years. These plumes were most likely caused by a large black hole, which is nowhere to be found these days. So, at the moment, we can only play a guessing game. Maybe two medium-sized black holes collided, pushing the newly merged giant out of the center of the galaxy. The observations of the stars in that galaxy have shown a clump of dense material a few thousand light-years away from the galaxy's core. Maybe it's the runaway black hole. But disappointingly, no X-ray signals are coming from that clump. Or the hole might still be there in its rightful place, but it's, you know, slumbering. If it doesn't get a fresh supply of gas and dust, it has nothing to feed on. As a result, it can't release a flood of x-rays. But again, the answer, do not disturb, the black hole is sleeping now, isn't very satisfying. Why isn't it getting its space food? What happened 50 million years ago? What is that clump of material speeding away from the galaxy center? So many questions, and no answers so far. At least, we know what black holes look like. Well, kinda. It's actually the shadow of a black hole's event horizon, visible against the glowing superheated material falling inside the hole. The first ever mugshot of a black hole appeared in 2019. But the data for its creation was collected in 2017. It took an international team, consisting of more than 200 astronomers, two years to assemble the image. We can admire this amazing space phenomenon thanks to a vast global network of telescopes called the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, or simply EHT. Why such a name? The thing is that the Event Horizon is a point of no return on the outskirts of a black hole. When something, for example, matter, radiation, or light, reaches this boundary, there is no way for it to escape the black hole's clutches. Anyway, to capture that very first image of a black hole, scientists created a virtual telescope that turned out as big as our planet by combining the power of eight powerful radio telescopes. But it wasn't an easy feat. The researchers had to simultaneously point the telescopes in a meticulously planned order with the help of precise atomic clocks set on each telescope. Plus, to keep the chances of rain and bad weather to a minimum, they even constructed the telescopes in super dry regions, such as the Atacama Desert in Chile and the South Pole. On each observation day, the telescope gathers roughly 350 terabytes of data. That's 10 times the amount of data collected every day at the Large Hadron Collider. But let's speak more about black holes themselves. There are stellar black holes, smaller but even more dangerous than their supermassive peers. They appear when stars that have run out of their star food fall into themselves. If a star used to be big enough, it keeps compressing and compressing some more, and voila! A baby stellar black hole is born. But even if I call such a hole a small one, 
it's still five to several tens of times heavier than the Sun. Unlike their massive siblings, hypothetical mini black holes could be really tiny, not bigger than an atom. Even so, just one minuscule thing would have the mass of a thousand SUVs. One theory claims tons of micro black holes could have been created right after the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. Some scientists even go as far as to say that a couple mini black holes pass through our planet every day. There is a supermassive black hole smack dab in the middle of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Its name is Sagittarius A star, and it's 4.3 million times as heavy as the Sun. And nope, we aren't going to be pulled into this hole. It's more than 26,000 light years from Earth, too far to have any influence on our planet. By the way, recently, astronomers have discovered that this supermassive black hole might be leaking. If it's true, it probably means that Sagittarius A star isn't a sleeping giant, as previously thought. It might still be active. And the leakage recorded by scientists may be the hole hiccuping while swallowing clouds of gas. Maybe we should burp this baby? If you ever find yourself near a black hole, hmm, get ready that time will significantly slow down. It may work for you if you aren't eager to grow older. Just don't let yourself be tugged beyond the point of no return. Another danger of hanging around a black hole is that it might start behaving like a massive galactic volcano. From time to time, black holes flare up. But instead of spewing lava, they produce enormous amounts of energy, and it makes gaping holes in the surrounding material and gas. A short time ago, scientists discovered one of the largest craters in the universe. Radio and X-ray telescopes detected a supermassive black hole that threw a temper tantrum many, many years ago. It happened in a galaxy cluster about 390 million light-years away from Earth. The crater left behind which was actually a hole punched in the cluster's hot gas, could fit 15 Milky Way galaxies. Okay, mind blown, I'm out of here. Asteroids flying around is sometimes like a fierce game of dodgeball, where you never know when some of them can go in your direction. So we can just track the situation and hope for the best. To figure out the risks, scientists from different organizations have to study the positions and paths of the asteroids that come close to our planet especially those that are at least 0.6 miles wide. And the good news is that none of these asteroids will probably hit us for at least the next 1,000 years. Phew! To give us an idea of their power, scientists did an experiment to simulate the impact of such a gigantic asteroid. The energy released from the collision would be a mind-blowing 100,000 megatons. That's like detonating 15,000 tons of dynamite. Also, if such a big asteroid hit us, Earth would cool down significantly because of all that debris that would go into the atmosphere and block sunlight. Plants wouldn't be able to get their fuel in this case, so we'd all be in trouble, both humans and animals. Thankfully, such mammoth asteroid impacts are quite rare. The larger an asteroid, the longer it takes it to collide with Earth. For example, it's estimated that asteroids with diameters of at least 0.6 miles strike our planet about once every 700,000 years. And if we're talking about even bigger ones that are three miles wide, well, those are predicted to come crashing down only once every 30 million years. Yay! But hold on. Don't get too relaxed just yet. Astronomers focus on really large asteroids because those are the ones that can kind of doom our planet if they hit us. Yep, you got it right. In a dinosaur kind of way. Even if one of them didn't erase us completely, the damage would still be enormous. So... There are still some asteroids wandering around that we need to keep an eye on to see how they might evolve over time. Scientists have a model of tracking them where they focus on the parts of an asteroid's path that come close to our planet to see if the space rock poses a risk to us. And it seems there might be one asteroid, 7482, 1994 PC1, 3,600 feet in diameter that might pose some danger. It's supposed to come closer to our planet in the next 1,000 years. And when I say risky, it means there's a 0.0151% chance of it coming within one Earth-Moon distance. It already passed by us in 2022, but we were lucky because it was far enough 1.2 million miles. I'd say we can relax when it comes to asteroid scenarios. For now, asteroids slamming into Earth would be new for humankind, but not for the planet itself. 
As I said, there weren't many of those big ones, but they still had enormous consequences. The first one that comes to most people's minds is, of course, the dinosaur asteroid as big as a mountain that struck our home planet around 66 million years ago near Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It was chaotic. Global firestorms and tsunamis were all over the place. Dust was blocking out the sun, and vaporized rock released sulfur, which then led to acid rain and the acidification of the oceans. But there was an even bigger fella that came before that one. Around two billion years ago, a gigantic asteroid crashed into our planet and left a massive crater in South Africa. The one we know today as the Redifort Crater. And it seems this asteroid might have been even bigger than we all originally thought twice as wide as the space rock that erased dinosaurs. The Redifor Crater is confirmed to be the biggest visible crater on Earth, with a diameter of about 99 miles. It used to be even bigger when it first formed, though. Maybe even 155 to 174 miles across. It's hard to figure out its true size because the crater has been eroding for the past two billion years. Think of it like slicing off layers from the rim of a bowl. The diameter gets smaller with each slice. When the asteroid, seven or five miles wide, that wiped away dinosaurs hit Earth about 66 million years ago, it caused massive destruction. Forest fires, acid rain, tsunamis, and so much ash and dust that it changed Earth's climate. This all made about 75% of life on our planet extinct. The asteroid that created the Redifort Crater was not only bigger, but it also traveled at a higher speed, which means the consequences there would have been even worse. But it happened a long time ago, and living beings were different back then. Maybe it was some bacteria that didn't even notice that something unusual was happening. Earth is not the only one. Lots of impacts have happened across our solar system, too. For example, in our close neighborhood. Yup, moving to Mercury and its massive crater called the Caloris Basin. It measures about 950 miles across, which is more than the state of Texas. There's a ring of towering mountains around the crater which makes it look even more impressive. You can see different colors in the mosaic image of the Caloris Basin. They tell us more about the geology of the basin. The orange parts represent lava that once flooded the basin. These lava flows covered the original surface and added this specific orange hue. And after the lava flooded the basin on Mercury, smaller craters formed on top of the lava surface. These craters dug into the ground and uncovered the material hidden beneath the lava. Some of this material is blue in color. And this blue stuff could be a clue about what the original floor of the basin had looked like before the lava covered it. Venus, the hottest planet in our solar system, has a thick atmosphere that comes with a pretty good defense system against space rocks. It's so dense that it burns up most meteors before they even reach its surface. As a result, you won't see as many visible craters on Venus as on other rocky planets in our solar system. But Venus still has some scars that can tell us about some serious impacts that happened there. And one of the biggest scars we know about is Mead Crater. It's enormous, about 170 miles in diameter. The inner floor of this crater is relatively flat and kind of brighter than its surroundings. It's possible that the crater ended up filled with a mixture of melted rock after the impact and maybe even lava from volcanic activity on Venus. Want to get an idea of what Earth might look like without its protective layer called atmosphere? Just take a look at the moon. Its surface is littered with impact craters. This Tycho is one of the craters you'll easily notice on the moon. When you look at the full moon, you can spot it as a distinct circle with bright rays that radiate outward, slightly off-center on the lower left side of the moon. This crater, 53 miles wide, has a beautiful central peak in the middle that's topped with an intriguing boulder. The size of this boulder is impressive. It would fill about half of a typical city block here on Earth. When talking about craters, we definitely can't leave out Mars. The red planet has a much thinner atmosphere than Earth. When spacecraft approach Mars, they rely on the planet's atmosphere to slow them down as they enter it. And indeed, the atmosphere helps slow spacecraft down during landing. But it's still not thick enough to completely protect Mars from all those space rocks that are coming all the time. From July to September 2018, a dark spot appeared on the southern pole of Mars. It consists of two distinct patterns. A theory says that the bigger, lighter colored blast pattern can be the result of an impact shock wave scouring the ice surface. The impact generated winds that spread out and scoured the ice. The inner blast pattern, which is darker in color, occurred because the impacting object managed to penetrate the thin ice layer. As it hit the surface, it sent dark sand and debris flying in all directions. 
We interrupt this program to bring you this important message. The earth is no longer fit for living, so you'll need to find your own new home. You immediately get the brilliant idea to apply for a job as an astronaut. You'll be able to wait over the hustle and bustle on the International Space Station until humanity finds a new home, right? The longest time a human has spent in space so far is 437 days and a few extra hours. And when I say in space, I mean the ISS, because a human being without the proper equipment in open space would only last a few seconds. The ISS is designed to support human life in space for extended periods of time. Extended, but not endless. The station gets resupplied with food, water, air, fuel, scientific equipment, and other necessities every three months. With no Earth or humans to send the mission, this lifeline will soon be broken. The station is a huge ship moving through space at over 17,000 miles per hour. It faces pretty harsh conditions, from radiation to micrometeoroids and huge temperature ups and downs. That's why the system regularly needs patching up. In addition to wear and tear, there are also unexpected events that can require resupply missions. In 2020, the crew discovered a leak that was causing a gradual loss of air pressure. They eventually found cracks in one of the modules. The crew managed to fix it, but it proves how important it is to have enough spare parts on board. Let's say the future humans will manage to find a way to run the station non-stop without restocking. Astronauts already grow plants in space in closed boxes with low-energy LED lights. It's not only a source of vitamins, without which humans can't survive, but a great mood booster. We'd also need more advanced closed-loop life support systems to recycle air and water efficiently. It's a system that captures carbon dioxide from the air by passing it through small beads. Then it uses steam to separate the carbon dioxide and transform it into methane and water. Water then divides back into oxygen. But even with all the possible advances, there's another problem. The health of the astronauts. They live and work in a microgravity environment, and they rely on carefully controlled life support systems. But our bodies aren't designed to live in weightlessness forever. It's like standing on your head, because the reduced gravity makes bodily fluids accumulate in the upper parts of your body. The result is a puffy red face. The gravitational force on the ISS is weaker than on Earth, so muscles don't have to work as hard and bones gradually lose their density. That's why each crew member follows a strict daily exercise routine. The heart muscle also weakens because it doesn't have to use as much effort to circulate blood throughout the body. Without Earth's protective atmosphere, astronauts are continuously exposed to cosmic rays. They are invisible waves that can cause some serious health issues. So maybe we're better off opting for Mars or the Moon for an alternative home. There's this mysterious thing in space, an unusual spot that scientists haven't been able to explain for more than 15 years. There are different theories, and one of them says that maybe this is an imprint from a collision with a parallel universe. Is this true? Well, let's see. Take a look at this map. This is the map of our universe. Well, not really. This is actually the map of cosmic microwave background radiation, or simply CMB. Many, many billions of years ago, there was a big bang. It was so powerful that it created our entire universe. And, of course, such an event couldn't occur without leaving some consequences. And these consequences are literally everywhere. The Big Bang left electromagnetic radiation, which we know as CMB. We don't notice it in our daily lives, but it's literally here, under our noses. And if you had some kind of superhuman vision, you would see how everything around you shines with this dim light. This radiation is very important. If we hadn't discovered the CMB, we would never have found out about the Big Bang. Previously, scientists believed that the universe had always existed. There was no beginning and there was no end. It sounded pretty ridiculous to us now, but less than a century ago, people were absolutely sure of it. Stephen Hawking was one of the first scientists to guess that the universe did, in fact, 
have a beginning. The guy was so cool that he realized this as a student while working on his doctoral dissertation. But unfortunately, he had no proof. If there was such a strong bang billions of years ago, then where are the traces? Where's the proof? Laughed people who believed in the eternal static universe theory. But don't worry, they had the proof rubbed in their faces real soon. In 1965, astronomers Arno Pienzas and Robert Wilson discovered CMB, and that was the first grandiose proof of the Big Bang. It turned out that radiation was everywhere. We just didn't notice it. In fact, at first, Pienzas and Wilson themselves mistook it for the noise of a big city, or pigeons, or something else. For their discovery, which turned the world of science upside down, they received the Nobel Prize. All right, so people learned that they were surrounded by electromagnetic radiation. Then they started collecting more data about it. They accumulated more and more info over the years until they made this very map. This is a map of CMB temperatures. But while creating it, scientists discovered something unusual. Let's take a look at this map. It looks like a large and diverse pattern of cold and warm places. But in reality, our universe is quite uniform. All temperatures on this map are close to negative 455 degrees Fahrenheit with very little difference. All temperature fluctuations between these places are small and each tiny speck actually spreads over millions of light years. So everything in our world is pretty calm and stable except for one point, this cold spot right here. Astronomers first discovered it in 2004. First, it looked like nothing unusual. It's just a region where the temperature is below average for a couple of microkelvins. But remember, we're not talking about a small area. This is a giant cold region. It's literally billions of light years in size. Wait, the scientists thought, this can't be true. The universe should be consistent everywhere. According to our standard model, this cold spot simply shouldn't exist. But it does exist though. This isn't just some mathematical error, it's right there. So what is this cold spot and how did it appear? Astronomers have been trying to find the answers to these questions for years. Even now, we have only a few theories. So let's discuss them all. Theory one, cosmic texture. This idea was brought up at the end of 2007. Then scientists suggested that this cold spot could be the hills of space. In other words, it may be a bumpy region of the universe, just part of its texture. But that's a silly explanation, so this theory was quickly discarded. Theory 2. The Supervoid This hypothesis was considered the most plausible for a while. It stated that the cold spot was actually the so-called supervoid. It's a terrifying dark place of our universe with almost no galaxies. And because it's an empty region with almost no stuff in there, it seems cold to us. However, this theory was refuted in May 2017. After carefully examining the cold spot, scientists found out that there were no signs of a supervoid there. Moreover, voids and supervoids, which actually exist by the way, are still very small in size. The cold spot is literally thousands of times bigger than them, so there must be some other explanation. And there is one, perhaps the most bizarre of them all. Theory 3. A Parallel Universe This controversial idea was put forward by cosmologist and theoretical physicist Laura Mersini Houghton. She suggested that the cold spot could be an imprint from the collision of our universe with a parallel one. Standard cosmology cannot explain such a giant cosmic hole, says Mersini Houghton. This is the unmistakable imprint of another universe beyond the edge of our own. Her assumption is based on the theory of the multiverse. This theory says that there's actually an infinite number of universes like ours in the world. They constantly collide with each other, giving each other a push which creates a new Big Bang. So maybe the cold spot is a bruise from such a collision. For quantum mechanics, such crazy theories are pretty common. But for standard physics and our simple understanding of the world, 
This is earth-shattering. Of course, we need strong evidence. And Mersini Houghton's team has begun to work on it. Professor Tom Shanks from the Center for Extragalactic Astronomy at Durham University also participates in this research. The craziest sounding of the exotic models for the explanation of the cold spot, the multiverse is actually the most standard in terms of our current model of the universe, he wrote in one of his works. So, what evidence do we need? Well, our cold spot is located in the southern hemisphere. According to Shanks, if there really was a collision between two universes, we should find another cold spot, and it should be in the opposite northern hemisphere. If astronomers actually found it, this theory would be confirmed, and it'd become the first proof of the existence of a parallel universe. But it's not that easy. To find a second spot, we need the latest, highly sensitive telescopes. We also need to find out some info about the nature of dark energy, how it affects space, and, in other words, there's still a lot of work to do. Not so long ago, scientists actually believed they had discovered the second spot. Researchers from New Mexico thought they had found it in the Northern Hemisphere. But unfortunately, this is likely to be a mistake. The map these researchers used had a high measure of randomness, so it's possible that their discovery is just an accident caused by other voids. So, basically, we haven't found another cold spot so far despite careful analysis. But again, even the best modern equipment is not perfect, and it doesn't mean that there's no second spot. It just means that we haven't found it yet. But if one day we did find it, it could change the world of science forever. We'd confirm not only the theory of parallel universes, but also the famous string theory. It could explain everything that occurs in our world. But if this happens, we'll get even more questions than we already have. How did these two universes collide? How does it all work? So far, it's all just guesswork. We can't claim that the cold spot is a print from the collision of parallel universes. But we can't refute this either. Actually, we may never know the truth at all. But it's still interesting to strive for it. If space were filled with air, the implications would reshape our understanding of the universe and the very nature of space travel, astronomy, and physics. Here are the potential consequences and considerations in such a scenario. Space travel, complexity. Current spacecraft are designed for a vacuum where they encounter minimal resistance. In a universe filled with air, space travel would resemble atmospheric flight, requiring spacecraft to be aerodynamic and robust enough to withstand air resistance and the heat generated from friction. Rockets would have wings. Rockets would need significantly more fuel to achieve the same speeds and distances, making space travel more complex and costly. Uh, satellites would need constant propulsion to stay in orbit, as atmospheric drag would cause them to slow down and fall back to Earth. This would make maintaining satellite networks for communication and GPS far more complex and resource intensive. Breathing in. Space. The presence of air might imply that astronauts could breathe in space eliminating the need for spacesuits and life support systems. However, if the air's composition and pressure were not suitable for human survival, or if temperatures were extreme due to solar radiation, heating the air, protective measures would still be necessary. Thermal dynamics. Space filled with air would have vastly different thermal dynamics. Heat from stars would warm the surrounding air, potentially leading to extreme temperatures across the universe. This could create a range of environments from scorchingly hot near stars to bitterly cold in areas far from stellar heat sources, affecting the habitability of planets and the feasibility of space exploration. Sound propagation. Unlike the current vacuum of space, air would allow sound to travel. This means that the noises of cosmic events such as supernovae or colliding asteroids could be audible. This would not only change the experience of space, but could also provide new data for astronomers to study celestial events. Astronauts on spacewalks might hear the hum of their spacecraft, the whirring of satellites, or even the sounds of solar storms and cosmic events, altered physics. The fundamental laws of motion and energy would behave differently in a universe filled with air.
Spacecraft and objects would lose momentum due to air resistance, and the propagation of electromagnetic waves would be affected, potentially altering how we observe and measure cosmic phenomena, astronomical observations. The clarity of observations made from within an air-filled space would decrease due to the scattering of light by air particles. This would complicate astronomical research and observation, making it harder to study distant stars, galaxies, and other celestial bodies without the clear view we currently have from Earth and space telescopes. Telescopes would struggle to get clear images due to the scattering of light by the air. Stars and galaxies would appear blurry, and many of the deep space discoveries we've made would be impossible with our current technology. Cosmic Radiation Shielding While air could offer some protection against cosmic radiation compared to the vacuum of space, its effectiveness would depend on the air's density and composition. This might not suffice to protect humans and the electronic equipment from the high energy particles prevalent in space. Orbital Mechanics the presence of air would also affect the orbit of celestial bodies. Planets, asteroids, and comets would experience drag as they move through space, potentially leading to orbital decay and altering the dynamics of solar systems and galaxies. With air resistance slowing down space debris, Earth might experience more frequent but less intense meteor showers as objects in space burn up in the denser atmosphere at higher altitudes evolution of stars and galaxies. The life cycles of stars might be different in a universe filled with air. The processes of star formation, supernovae explosions, and black hole formation would be influenced by the interaction with the surrounding air, possibly leading to different types of astronomical structures and phenomena. Living and working in space would be different in such a universe. The experience of walking on a planet without a spacesuit and hearing the sounds of space would be profound. However, the challenges of dealing with the dynamic and potentially hostile environments created by air and space would necessitate new strategies and technologies for exploration and habitation. In conclusion, an air-filled universe would present a radically different reality from what we know today. The physics of movement, the nature of space exploration, the methods of astronomical observation, and even the sounds and sights of space would be transformed. The challenges would be immense, but the opportunities for discovery and understanding would be equally vast. In February 2024, Varda Space Industries' W-1 capsule landed in Utah after having spent around eight months in orbit. It was carrying space-grown antiviral medicine aboard. This Californian startup can be considered the first in-space manufacturing effort. The 200-pound capsule was designed to carry drug research into microgravity. This success makes Varda just the third enterprise to recover an intact spacecraft from its orbit around our planet. The other two are SpaceX and its Dragon vehicles, and Boeing with its Starliner capsule. You might know that SpaceX is a private spaceflight company that sends satellites and people to space. NASA crews traveling to the International Space Station included. The company is also creating and testing a Starship system that could be used for lunar landings and future crewed missions to Mars. But let's get back to the capsule from the W-1 mission launched by Varda Space Industries. It brought to Earth crystals of an antiviral substance grown in orbit. Varda is planning to become a major player in off-Earth manufacturing. According to the company, this production option offers loads of advantages. And one of them is microgravity. Microgravity or near-weightless conditions existing in the cosmos offer a unique environment for processing materials. These beneficial conditions are not available on Earth. Plus, it allows the formation of more perfect structures because there's no added stress that appears because of gravity. Varda claims that the W series stands alone as the only all-in-one commercial satellite and re-entry vehicle designed specifically for returning materials from orbit. Meanwhile, other operational re-entry vehicles are built with humans in mind. It means serious cost increases because of all the amenities needed to sustain astronauts. There have been private companies returning space-made products to Earth before. One of them is the Californian company Made in Space. It has brought home high-value optical fiber lots of times. 
but made in space, manufactured its production aboard the International Space Station and then hauled the ZBLAN fiber down to our planet in SpaceX Dragon capsules. Meanwhile, Varda wants to make this process even more efficient and cost-effective. To do it, they're planning to use their small, uncrewed capsules. Those can serve both as mini factories and return vehicles. The W-1 test mission provided the company with the first opportunity to strut its stuff. Varda's three-foot-wide conical capsule was integrated into a Rocket Lab Photon spaceship. This craft was responsible for navigation, power, propulsion, and some other services. The mission lifted off in June 2023 on SpaceX's Transporter 8 rideshare flight. At first, Varda wanted to bring those crystals home after just a few months in orbit. Unfortunately, the company came across an unexpected obstacle. They had problems with getting the needed re-entry approval from the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration and other authorities operating the targeted landing zones, the Utah Test and Training Range, and the nearby Dugway Proving Ground. Both of these areas are west of Salt Lake City. By the way, both places are no strangers to returning spaceships. Not so long ago, the return capsule of NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission landed at the UTTR. It was carrying more than 4 ounces of material received from the near-Earth asteroid Bennu. This seven-year-long mission delivered the samples in a return canister that came to a full stop on the 24th of September, 2023, parachuting into a remote stretch of land in Utah. The OSIRIS-REx sample is the biggest carbon-rich asteroid sample that has ever been brought to our planet. This space rock might help researchers investigate the origins of life on Earth. What makes the asteroid material so unique is the fact that it was captured in space. Most meteorites have to endure a fiery fall through the atmosphere of our planet, and we can only get our hands on their changed bits and pieces. Asteroid strikes, gamma ray bursts, supernovae blasts, and other terrifying threats could potentially take out humanity. But one of them is inescapable. A cataclysmic event that will happen around 1 billion years from now and most likely rob our planet of its oxygen, effectively wiping out all life forms. Nearly two and a half billion years ago, there was a period called the Great Oxidation Event. It gave us a breathable atmosphere, thanks to which we're all alive today. Cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, appeared on Earth, filling the atmosphere with oxygen. It eventually led to the appearance of a world filled with multicellular life forms. But then, one of Earth's greatest die-offs occurred. It happened 450 million years ago. This event is known as the Late Ordovician Mass Extinction. Scientists think it might have happened because the inverse process took place. The level of oxygen on the planet dropped dramatically, and it lasted for several millions of years. It's unclear what could have caused such an extreme event. During this period, the continents formed one jumbled mass called Gondwana. Most life on Earth lived in the oceans, but plants were starting to colonize land. Near the end of the Ordovician period, a climate shift covered the supercontinent with glaciers. This dramatic cooling alone was enough to lead a lot of species to the brink of extinction. And then, oxygen levels plummeted, which caused the second wave of extinction. Scientists have found evidence of this event in seafloor samples gathered from all over the world. Some are sure that glaciers were responsible for changing the layers of the oceans, which had previously had unique temperatures and specific concentrations of elements like oxygen. However, the exact cause of the oxygen drop is still unclear. Whatever the cause, more than 80% of life on Earth disappeared during the Latiordovician mass extinction. Could a deoxygenation event happen again? Some researchers draw an eerie comparison to today's situation. They say that climate change is already reducing oxygen levels in our oceans. It's likely to make loads of species go extinct and the world to change beyond recognition. Now, even if global cooling triggered the late Ordovician mass extinction, what sparked this process in the first place? There's a theory claiming it could have been a gamma ray burst. These bursts seem to be the most violent and energetic explosions in space, and they might be related to supernovae. 
Thankfully, we haven't seen such a burst close enough to fully figure out what it is. So far, they have only been spotted in other galaxies. If a gamma ray burst occurred in our home Milky Way galaxy, it could also lead to a mass extinction on Earth. A burst pointed in our direction might only last 10 seconds or so. And still, it would destroy at least 50% of Earth's ozone layer. Yes, in such a short period of time. Even a relatively small amount of ozone depletion is enough to cause serious harm to our planet's natural sunscreen. And wiping out ozone on a large scale can wreak havoc, finishing huge numbers of species, starting with the ones living in the upper levels of the ocean. Gamma rays also break apart atmospheric oxygen and nitrogen. These gases turn into nitrogen dioxide, commonly known as smog. If this smog blanketed Earth, it would block out sunshine and trigger a global ice age. But our ultimate fate is much more dramatic than any of these scenarios. Most life on Earth will eventually disappear due to lack of oxygen after solar activity causes atmospheric oxygen to drop back down to the level it had been before the great oxygen event occurred. The sun ages and puts out more and more energy. At one point, around one billion years from now, Earth will reach the point where atmospheric carbon dioxide will begin to break down. That's when oxygen-producing plants and organisms will disappear. Earth won't have enough life forms to sustain the oxygen-rich atmosphere all living beings on our planet need. This process may take as few as 10,000 years, and it seems to be unavoidable. Luckily, we still have around 1 billion years to figure out how to save ourselves. A super-Earth, ready to be explored, is floating in space relatively close to us, a mere 337 light-years away from our planet. The term super-Earth is used to describe a planet beyond the solar system, with a mass higher than that of Earth, but below those of the ice giants of the solar system, Uranus and Neptune. Their masses are 14.5 and 17 times that of our planet, respectively. The term also refers only to the mass of the planet, not its habitability or surface conditions. But the coolest thing about this newly discovered super-Earth is that it might harbor a second Earth-sized planet. The bigger planet is dubbed Toy 715b. It orbits within the conservative habitable zone of its parent star. Moving within this region means there might be liquid water on the planet's surface. Of course, Several other factors need to line up for the surface water to appear. But the conservative habitable zone, unlike the optimistic, habitable zone, makes the planet a great candidate for harboring water. As for the smaller planet, it's likely to be just a bit larger than Earth. And it might also dwell inside the conservative habitable zone. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope as well as other new space-borne instruments, are designed not only to detect distant worlds, but also to reveal some of their main features, including the composition of their atmospheres. And based on this knowledge, we can get clues to the possible presence of life there. The newly discovered super-Earth Toy 715 Bond orbits a red dwarf, a star smaller and cooler than our Sun. At the moment, such stars remain prime candidates for finding habitable planets orbiting them. Those miniature rocky worlds have far closer orbits than those circling around stars like our Sun. But since red dwarfs are small and cool, the planets don't risk anything when crowding closer. They're still safely within the star's habitable zone. Tighter orbits also mean that planets cross the faces of their stars more often. In the case of Toy 715b, it's once every 19 days. That's how long a year in this mysterious distant world lasts. Star-crossing, or transiting, planets can be detected more easily and observed more frequently. And it's great for TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which found the new planet. This satellite has been adding to a long list of habitable zone exoplanets since its launch in 2018. Unfortunately, observing such transits for Earth-sized planets moving around Sun-like stars is beyond the capability of the space telescopes we have today. Plus, it takes too long, an entire year, to wait for a new transit. 
planet Toi 175b is now on the list of habitable zone planets that can be examined more closely by the James Webb Telescope. Who knows? Maybe this awesome instrument will spot signs of an atmosphere surrounding the planet. Its presence, or absence, will depend on other properties of the planet, like its mass and size. Also, we need to figure out whether it can be classified as a water world. If it is, then its atmosphere, if present, will be more prominent and less difficult to detect than that of a more massive, drier, and denser planet, likely to keep its low-profile atmosphere close to the surface. Experts say that Toi 715b might have once had an atmosphere thicker than that of Neptune, and now the planet could be in a transition state where it's losing its atmosphere. To confirm this suspicion, scientists need to figure out the planet's mass. Once they do it, they'll likely know whether TOI 715b is a watery terrestrial planet. By the way, if the second, yet unconfirmed, Earth-sized planet turns out to be real, it will be the smallest habitable zone planet ever discovered by TESS. At the moment, James Webb is our best bet for observing the characteristics of these faraway worlds. But in the coming years, the next generation of ground-based, extremely large telescopes will be able to peer deeper into space, looking for new exoplanets. The Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes cooperate to explore space. Their observations complement each other and provide us with a broader view of the universe. But there are some significant differences between these two space explorers. Let's compare them. Currently, James Webb is the largest and most technically advanced telescope we've ever built. It can peer back over 13.5 billion years, observing the first stars and galaxies forming in the darkness of the early universe. The telescope's infrared vision cuts through massive clouds of gas and dust where planetary systems and stars form. This ability goes way beyond Hubble's infrared view, used for studying distant exoplanets. Hubble can actually observe space in near-infrared light, but it was optimized for shorter ultraviolet and visible wavelengths of light. This difference is what makes Webb and Hubble an awesome pair of observatories covering a broad wavelength range. Both Hubble and Webb are reflecting telescopes, which means that they use curved mirrors instead of lenses to gather and bend light to their numerous instruments. And still, these two have some obvious differences. Hubble observes the universe from an orbit just above Earth's atmosphere. That's why it needs to block stray light coming from the Sun, as well as sunlight reflected by Earth and the Moon, from entering the telescope. To accomplish it, the forward assembly of the observatory is wrapped in an insulated, aluminized Teflon light shield. This gives the telescope its tube shape. As for James Webb, it has a large, multi-layered sunshield that looks nothing like Hubble's light shield. And still, it serves the same purpose. Webb's primary mirror, which is more than 21 feet across, is way larger than Hubble's 7.9 foot one. No wonder Webb has more than six times the light collecting area that Hubble has. It's very important at the longer and dimmer wavelengths of light James Webb sees. You see, the universe is constantly expanding, and light from distant objects gets stretched when it travels to Earth. Shorter, bluer wavelengths of light stretch toward longer, redder wavelengths. That's why distant objects that look bright in blue or ultraviolet light turn red or red-shifted once their light reaches Earth. They also get way dimmer. Webb's primary mirror gathers more of this dim, red-shifted light, giving us clear views of objects 100 times fainter than what Hubble can see. Hubble is optimized to see ultraviolet and visible light. That's why its primary mirror doesn't need to be as cold as Webb's. More than 200 thermal sensors keep Hubble's instruments at optimal temperatures. An array of heaters warms the back of Hubble's primary mirror. That's where the observatory's science equipment is located. This part needs to be stiff and thermally stable. So Hubble's heaters maintain a temperature of 70 degrees F. As for Webb, it needs to be much colder than Hubble to capture those faint infrared wavelengths of light. The problem is, unlike visible light, we can't see infrared light with our eyes. But we can feel it because it's heat, 
or thermal radiation. When you turn your face toward the sun, you feel warmth. That's what thermal radiation is. To be able to capture the remains of the heat from objects so insanely far away, Webb needs to be extremely cold – minus 364 degrees F. To maintain this temperature, the telescope needs to shield itself from the infrared radiation coming from the Sun, Earth, and the Moon. That's why it has to be way farther from our planet than Hubble. Hubble orbits Earth 326 miles above the surface of the planet. But Webb orbits the Sun with Earth around 1 million miles away from home. From its perspective, the Sun, Earth, and the Moon are always in the same part of the sky. It allows the observatory's enormous sun shield to block the light coming from these space objects and keep the telescope cool. The gravitational forces of Earth and the Sun also make it convenient and easy for the telescope to hold its orbit. Webb only needs an occasional modest rocket thrust to keep its steady orbit. As for Hubble, due to its close proximity to Earth, it needs to deal with a dent in our planet's magnetic field. This dent is called the South Atlantic Anomaly, and it collects charged particles from the Sun. It tends to cause communication disruptions and problems with electrical systems. Hubble has to pass through this region 10 times every day, staying there for nearly 15% of its time. If you somehow fell into a black hole, it might change your future and erase your past. Well, at least theoretically. Let's start with the real world we live in. Here on planet Earth, your past can definitely define your future. But imagine you're not on Earth, but somewhere out there in the endless universe, and you stumble upon a certain type of black hole. The one hmm. that a UC Berkeley mathematician found. Not to mix it with a regular black hole, let's call this type… what about a benign black hole, huh? So here's why you need a specific black hole. Thing is, you're highly unlikely to stay alive in a regular black hole. But according to some calculations made by a postdoctoral fellow, Hintz, from UC Berkeley, this specific type of black holes we agree to call benign ones might expand at an accelerating rate. This is what makes it possible to survive the transition from our deterministic world to a black hole, which is not deterministic. Hmm. Let's imagine you survived that passage and now you're moving towards the center of a benign black hole. It's impossible to picture what's inside. And if you, as a traveler, could actually get into a black hole, you'd never be able to communicate to the outer world what interesting things are hidden in it. But it's not what interests us for now. We need to know how to get rid of the past. Hence, the mathematician you already know studies non-rotating black holes that have an electric charge. The most important thing about them is that besides the event horizon, they also have the Cauchy horizon. And here's the point. The Cauchy horizon is the place where so-called determinism simply breaks down. This may sound too scientific, but let me explain it to you. The Cauchy horizon is the place where your past doesn't determine your future any longer. So, here's a mathematically proven and apparently working method of how to get rid of your past. All you need to do is get into space, find a specific black hole, make it to the center, and get to the Cauchy horizon. However, if it sounds too complicated, you can simply try not to make mistakes here on Earth. Yeah, ideas like, your past gets cancelled, you have an infinite amount of options of how your future will evolve. And all that jazz sounds as unrealistic as they are appealing. Like, imagine no one knows you failed to get into college and get a degree, but from now on, you have every opportunity to do whatever you want. But only theoretically. In reality, once you get into the black hole, not that specific one we've already talked about, you're most likely to disappear once and for all. But hey, don't be sad. I'm only talking about your current physical form. It's a bit deeper than it might seem. Thing is, there's a curious principle of quantum mechanics that can be explained in a simple way. For starters, imagine that you're not a human being, but just information. You have your experience, your background, and your thoughts. All of these are the information you are. Now, let's make it even simpler. Imagine a USB drive or a book. Both of these things contain information. If you smash a USB drive that contains music and movies, 
It won't exist anymore in its physical form, but the information it had will never stop existing. Same with the book. If you burn it, the information it has doesn't get burned. It continues to exist, but in another form. So, this fun theory claims that even though someone passes the horizon of events, which is a point of no return before you get spaghettified, they don't stop existing. In simple words, these universe travelers still exist, but in the form of information. Now, let's go back to the black holes. According to Stephen Hawking, black holes emit radiation. Radiation makes them shrink, and with time, I mean much time, a black hole can shrink so much that it eventually disappears. So what happens to the astronaut who got entangled in a black hole if it disappears? Nope, they won't be ejected from the black hole in the way they used to exist. However, they will still be ejected from there, but in the form of parking radiation. But it's just a theory. Right, you remember that no one knows exactly what happens in the black hole? Another theory says that what happens in the black hole doesn't really stay in the black hole. Sounds like a good alternative to Las Vegas if all the flights for the weekends have been booked. Some scientists believe that a black hole might have a portal where you can turn back time. According to this theory, there's a white hole at the end of a black hole. If you get there, you can undo things. Like you broke your mom's favorite vase? Hop into the white hole and it'll be as good as new there. You cooked a scramble and made a fresh orange juice, but somehow lost your appetite. It's not a problem if you cook it inside a white hole. Voila! The eggs are unbroken. The oranges are uncut and juicy again. No more food waste. All right, turning back time sounds really cool. So I guess we might actually need a black hole to help us out. If a black hole was made in a, let's say, lab, it could devour things until it grew big enough to consume the entire planet. First, it would munch on the Large Hadron Collider, which might possibly create something similar to a black hole here on Earth. Next, Geneva, where the Large Hadron Collider is located. Then the whole country of Switzerland, then Europe. At that point, it wouldn't be long before the Earth was gone too. Luckily, if a black hole did appear, it would be so small that it wouldn't be able to do anything. Black holes actually produce a lot of energy and release it, often as heat, like a furnace. That means they will fade away when they run out of fuel. Even if a stable microscopic black hole was created, it would grow so slowly that nothing would happen. Assuming that it survived long enough to absorb the tiny particles around it, a black hole of this size would take super long to get even a pound of weight. I won't be around then, but a black hole on Earth could be a great thing. Even a relatively small one may emit enough energy to completely power humanity. We're talking a lot about food, huh? Let's not forget about spaghettification. The concept is quite simple, by the way. It's all about gravity. Imagine you're playing with chewing gum. With your force, you could easily stretch it so instead of a regular piece, you can get a long and thin one. The same happens to you black hole force is enough to stretch you as if you were a piece of chewing gum. Gravity holds you tight on one side, which makes you stretch. You may wonder, how come you don't get spaghettified on Earth if there's gravity too? Easy peasy, it's just too weak to do that with you. If you asked a butterfly to stretch the gum, would it be able to do that? Not likely, their tiny limbs are just too weak. Same here, the Earth is just too weak compared to a black hole. So, if you are wondering whether you'll ever reach 6 foot 6, it may never happen on Earth. But once you're in a black hole, you can go far beyond those mere 6 foot 6 inches. Your best height moment won't last long though. If you stretch the chewing gum at one moment, it will simply tear apart. The same will happen to you because of spaghettification. We still can't find the source of the mysterious signal we've been receiving since 2018. We receive it every 22 minutes and nothing can explain this. Some scientists even believe it could be coming from another civilization we haven't met yet.
This strange radio signal wasn't found by a scientist on a serious mission. It was actually discovered by a college student just doing a regular project for school. Tyrone O'Doherty, an undergrad student at Curtin University in Australia, was sifting through old data of the southern sky. He was looking for any weird blinking radio signals. He finally stumbled upon one from 2018 that seemed to shoot radio waves towards Earth like a lighthouse beam. Excited about his find, Tyrone shared it with his mentor, radio astronomer Natasha Hurley-Walker. She dove into researching this signal, hoping for a breakthrough. But despite checking different frequency data, they hit a dead end. But then, Natasha spotted a pattern. The signal repeated every 18 minutes. This was huge. But just as they were gearing up to study it further, poof! The signal vanished after only three months, leaving them with nothing. Not giving up, Natasha and her team scanned the skies again, desperate for a clue. Months passed, but nothing turned up. They were ready to give up, and then suddenly, a new signal popped up. This one kept blinking for five minutes, then it disappeared. And then it came back exactly 22 minutes later. The main question was if that signal was related to an 18-minute one. To figure it out, Natasha went back to the old radio data from that area. As they dug deeper, they realized that, yes, and these signals aren't anything new. They've been beaming towards Earth for 35 years. Back in 1988, Indian and American telescopes had caught them, but they got buried under tons of other data. This was great news for space explorers, because it meant they could now calculate how far away this mysterious object was. After doing the math, they figured out it was incredibly far, even on a space scale, 15,000 light-years from Earth. Now, the only thing left to uncover was what exactly this object was. Walker and his team started comparing it to all the known radio-emitting objects out there. Yet its source remains a mystery. The signals still pop up every 22 minutes on NASA screens, always ending with a frustrating match-not-found message. The scientists called it J183910. Some think that the signal might come from some extraterrestrial beings. Maybe it's the signal that SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has been waiting for. This project has been working for over 50 years, trying to find any evidence of life beyond Earth. They also scan the skies for radio waves, laser pulses, and other mysterious signals. So maybe it's a way for extraterrestrial folk to communicate their location. While that idea may sound exciting, we need to be careful about jumping to conclusions. First, we don't have solid proof for that. Before any concrete evidence, it's just speculation. And also, there are other more plausible explanations. Most likely, it comes from a natural phenomenon, and there are a couple of theories for that. The first one is the pulsar theory. Imagine a huge star in space much bigger than our sun. Sometimes these big stars finish their life journeys in a spectacular event called a supernova. When this happens, the star's core collapses, becoming super compact as if you're squeezing all the stuff from that star into a tiny space. That tiny, super-dense core is called a neutron star. Some of these neutron stars are extra special. We call them pulsars. They get their name because they seem to pulse with energy, like a space lighthouse. These pulsars have incredibly strong magnetic fields, much stronger than what you'd find on Earth. They're like enormous magnets in space. Because of this, they shoot out beams of energy. They're also spinning super fast, so these beams of energy seem to pulse on and off as they spin around. Now, the strange signal we detected seems to have similarities with pulsars, but not quite. Pulsars usually have a predictable lifespan and slow down over time, eventually stopping their radio signals. In contrast, our mysterious signal is quite persistent and is blinking beyond what's expected for pulsars. So, maybe it's not a typical pulsar, or not a pulsar at all. There's also a magnetar theory. Now, a magnetar is another type of neutron star. They're like supercharged versions of pulsars, 
with even stronger magnetic fields and slightly longer pulsating periods. Maybe this is what causes our signal's intense persistence. However, when we plotted the data, we also realized the signal didn't match the magnetar's vibes either. Magnetars not only send out radio waves, but also powerful X-rays because they're so energetic. But the signal we received was only sending out radio waves. So we figured it's not a pulsar and not a magnetar. The signal's behavior is very strange and suggests an unnatural source. This means there might be something in the universe that scientists haven't fully explored yet. And there is a space object that we don't know much about. The final theory is the so-called dwarf pulsar. Sounds a little dopey to me. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Now, a dwarf pulsar is like a star that blinks with light flashes, similar to pulsars, but it takes longer for each blink. Usually, white dwarfs are the leftovers from smaller stars. They don't blink because their magnetic field isn't as strong as pulsars. But when a white dwarf becomes pretty hefty, almost the mass of our sun, it gets super dense and starts pulsating with a strong magnetic field, just like pulsars. They have a cool quirk. White dwarfs are made of electrons, not neutrons like pulsars. When these charged electrons start dancing with the magnetic field, they shoot out periodic light flashes, which happen every 100 to 1,000 seconds. As you remember, our signal has a period of 22 minutes, 1,320 seconds. A bit longer than the usual white dwarf pulsars, but it's much closer to the truth. So far, this sounds like the most plausible explanation. But even this theory isn't fully confirmed yet. This just shows how much there is in the universe that we're still figuring out. For example, fast radio bursts, another mysterious type of signal we've been detecting. They're like quick, intense bursts of energy in the form of radio waves. They have a ton of energy. FRBs are so powerful that sometimes they can be brighter than entire galaxies. Now, imagine this. They release as much energy in a few milliseconds as our sun does in three whole days. Wow! These bursts happen all over the sky with huge frequencies, although some have been detected with lower frequencies. Every day, we catch around 10,000 random FRBs in the sky. Some of them repeat, but most happen once and disappear forever. Unfortunately, most of them only last for a fraction of a second, and by the time their energy reaches us, it's a thousand times weaker than a mobile phone signal from the moon. This is why, despite their brightness, there's still a lot we don't understand about them. We're still trying to figure out what causes these FRBs. They could be coming from different sources, like already mentioned magnetars, colliding stars, or even merging galaxies or white dwarfs. As these bursts travel through space, they pick up information about the cosmic environments they pass through, like interstellar gas clouds. It's very unlikely that FRBs are some messages from extraterrestrial beings, though. Not only because there are thousands of them every day all across the sky, but also because we know that the sources of these bursts must be incredibly energetic themselves. Our neighbors would have to have equipment stronger than entire galaxies for that. But the bottom line is, while all these signals are fascinating, there's still a ton to learn about them. Now, Jupiter used to be flat and look like an M&M candy. Now I'm hungry. And it wasn't the only flat pattern in our solar system. Turns out, there are tons of things that can go wrong during a planet's formation, like locking up to the sun or getting whooshed into open space. Let's check it out. The Earth isn't flat, but Jupiter might have been. Instead of being a big round ball, gas giants in our system might have started more like flat pancakes. Jupiter is one of the oldest of our neighbors. It's 4.6 billion years old, just like our Sun. And when it was just a baby planet, it likely formed through a process called disk instability. It all begins with stars. When a star is forming, it doesn't look like a round object. It's more like a big disk of stuff. During this stage, really hot winds made of charged particles blow out. 
The dust in that disk contains stuff like carbon and iron. Some of them collide and stick together, forming bigger objects. Dust turns into pebbles, pebbles turn into rocks, and rocks bump into each other, getting bigger. Gas in the disks helps all these solid bits stick together. Some break apart, but others stick around, and they're the ones that become the basic pieces of planets. They're called planetesimals. Even gas giants like Jupiter started off as tiny specks of dust, smaller than a human hair. Eventually, they formed their own big ring-shaped disks of gas. They began to spin around our sun, growing bigger by gathering gas and rocks like snowballs. Gas giants are special. They were born from the colder parts of the disk. In cold areas, molecules are slower, which makes them easier to grab. In these places, water could freeze, and tiny ice pieces stick together and are mixed with dust. These dirty snowballs gather up and then form cores of huge planets, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. In the warmer areas closer to the star, rocky planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars start to form. After the icy giants were born, there wasn't much gas left for these smaller planets. It might take tens of millions of years for these rocky planets to form after the star is born. And our sun was growing at the same time, sucking up nearby gas and pushing far away stuff even farther out. After billions of years, the disk changed completely, turning into a round star with a bunch of planets, dwarf planets, asteroids, moons, meteoroids, and comets around it. Recently, simulations showed that these protoplanets as these early dust balls are called, don't start off looking like the planets we know. In the case of gas giants like Jupiter, they look more like squashed balls or M&M's candies, not the peanut kind. When the sun was young, the disk of gas and dust surrounding it cooled down and became unstable. It started breaking into big chunks. These chunks dramatically collapsed together under huge gravity to create Jupiter. It became a round gas giant over time. There are a lot of oddities that can happen during that process of planet formation. Ever wonder why Venus or Uranus spin in the opposite way compared to other planets? Usually, when things form from a spinning disk of gas, they tend to spin in the same direction. For example, if you spin a bunch of balls on a string, they all twirl in the same way. So, theoretically, all planets should spin in the same direction too. But there are a lot of fast-moving objects, like comets and asteroids, in our solar system. When they smash into planets, especially during their early days, this collision might send the planets to spin in the opposite direction. Venus and Uranus probably survived a massive collision. Luckily, they weren't repelled to outer space. The gravity from the Sun and nearby planets pulled them back into place. There are also so-called tidally locked planets. These are celestial bodies that spin in a way where one side always faces their star, while the other side remains in perpetual darkness. So one side is always very hot, while the other is extremely cold. Hmm. If we were on a planet like that, we would only be able to live on a thin line in between. These planets form when they're very close to their star. The gravitational forces are extremely strong, and over time, these forces slow down the planet's rotation until it matches the time it takes to orbit the star. Imagine you're spinning in your chair. Someone comes up to you and, holding onto your chair with their hands, starts spinning with you. This way, you'll always face each other. Tidally locked planets kind of work like that. Our moon is tidally locked to our Earth, which is why we only see one side of it. We've discovered more than 5,000 planets outside of our solar system called exoplanets. Some of them have very strange orbits. For example, planets with incredibly long orbits, thousands of years to make one trip around the star, or very wonky, comet-like orbits, or so-called hot Jupiters. They're super close to their star, way closer than Mercury is to our Sun. But these planets couldn't have formed where they are now. As their solar system evolved, they changed their positions for some reason. This rearranging is called planetary migration. There are three main ways this migration happens. First, because of the gas and dust spinning around the planet. When a planet is bumping into this stuff, 
it can create spiral patterns in the gas. These patterns can either push the planet closer to the center or farther away, depending on how they mix together. It's called a gas-driven migration. This is what Jupiter experienced when it moved closer to the Sun billions of years ago. I wasn't around then. This also explains the existence of hot Jupiters. Second, big planets can shove the smaller ones, changing their paths. Third, the star's gravity can tug on the planet, making its orbit more circular. Ever heard of rogue planets? Imagine a lonely planet floating in the vastness of space without a star to call home. They're like the wandering nomads of our galaxy, doomed to drift around forever. And there are so many of them. There might be more free-floating planets than ones that are tied to stars. We're talking trillions of rogue planets hanging out in our Milky Way galaxy alone. They're often as massive as our biggest planet, Jupiter. But most of them might be Earth-sized. Some might even have thick atmospheres that keep them warm, even though they're far from any star. Some of them might have wild auroras, while others could host moons with liquid water, a potential haven for life. There's even a chance that they might contain extraterrestrial life. These planets might bump into other stars or even entire planetary systems as they journey through space. Sometimes they might get caught in a star's gravity for a while before getting flung back out into space. But how are they born? Sometimes, during this chaotic process of planet formation, not all planets can manage to stay close to their parent stars. Some of them get kicked out of their solar systems due to powerful gravitational interactions with other planets or passing stars. These ejected planets become rogue planets. In 2012, astronomers found a solar system from the very beginning of the universe. The system included a star and two planets. We called it a fossil system. The star is super old, about 13 billion years, almost as old as our entire universe. It was mostly made of just hydrogen and helium. This is unusual because planets usually form from clouds of gas that contain heavier stuff. That's when we figured out that the way planets formed before was different from how they form now. We know that stars with more metals are more likely to have planets. In astronomy lingo, metals means any chemical element other than hydrogen and helium. But in the early universe, there weren't many metals. Most of them were created inside stars and then spread out into space when those stars blew up. So when did the very first planets form? This newly discovered system helps answer these questions. Its two giant planets are orbiting a star that's incredibly low in metals and extremely old. This should be really rare, if not impossible, but they exist. This means that maybe there are more planets in metal-poor systems than we thought. Studying them will help us learn more about the history of planet formation. If the multiverse theory is correct, ours is not the only one out there. Which is as interesting as it is scary, right? Now, not every scientist is on board with this mind-bending concept. And let's be honest, the idea of actually making contact with these parallel universes sounds about as probable as winning the lottery while riding a unicycle. But hold on tight, because this strange concept isn't just limited to the realms of fiction anymore. Believe it or not, a bunch of scientific theories actually support the existence of parallel universes. And let me tell you, it's a topic that stirs up quite the debate in scientific groups. Now picture this. The universe we live in is mind-numbingly vast. We're talking billions, some say even trillions, of galaxies swirling around, each packed with an almost uncountable number of stars. Some brainiacs studying the universe's shape suggest that its diameter could span a staggering 7 billion light years. Others even argue that it might be infinite. Could there be more out there than meets the eye? Well, real scientific theories are exploring the possibility of universes existing alongside, beyond, or even mirroring our own. These intriguing concepts of multiverses and parallel worlds often intertwine with other, more familiar scientific ideas like the Big Bang, string theory, and quantum mechanics. In order for us to figure out what's out there, we have to rely on the information we're a bit more confident in, right? Let's rewind the cosmic clock about 13.7 billion years ago, 
everything we're able to see today was squished into a minuscule singularity. Then, if the Big Bang theory is to be trusted, it all went boom. The universe inflated with a speed faster than that of light everywhere, within less than a second. The way the universe went pop has led some clever researchers to ponder the existence of more than one universe. They question whether that sudden growth ended everywhere at the same time. While the expansion ceased for everything we're able to see from Earth 13.8 billion years ago, cosmic inflation might still be ongoing in some other mysterious corners. Some theoretical physicists say that as inflation ends in one place, a new balloon universe forms. But here's the catch. You can't just hop from one bubble to another like intergalactic tourists. These bubble universes are expanding indefinitely, and their edges are zooming away from us faster than light can travel. And here's where things get even more confusing. Let's say we somehow manage to reach the edge of our local balloon and encounter the next universe. Well, those same theoretical physicists mentioned that the neighboring universe could be a whole different ball game. It might have completely different laws of physics, making it a bizarre place for us. Following the same idea, some say that in this vast multiverse of bubble universes, there might be other life forms just like us. The problem is, we're getting farther away from them with each passing moment, and our paths will never cross. Other super smart researchers out there are trying to connect parallel universes with quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics is basically the fancy math behind teeny tiny particles. According to it, these particles can exist in multiple states all at once. They call it a wave function that holds all the crazy options. But here's the catch. When we observe these particles, we only see one outcome. It's like the universe keeps playing hide and seek with us. Now there's this theory called the many worlds theory that says whenever we observe one outcome, another universe pops up where a different outcome becomes real. It's like our universe acts as a giant tree, constantly branching into countless versions of itself. These alternate universes can't mingle though, so you wouldn't even know if there are a bunch of other yous living slightly, or totally, different lives. This many worlds theory is pretty bold, and a bit hard to prove or disprove. And that's not great for science, because scientists love to test and experiment with their ideas. But if there's infinite space out there, why wouldn't there be infinite universes too? Try to imagine the universe as this giant cosmic playground. Some specialists believe that if it's indeed never-ending, then there's only a limited number of ways that its building blocks can arrange themselves. Eventually, they have to repeat certain patterns. If this is true, then it may be possible that somewhere out there, there might be another version of you living the exact same life, even down to what you had for brunch yesterday. Did we ever have any proof of these supposed parallel universes? Well, some say we did. Have you heard the tale of the mysterious man from Taured? It's the story of a man that ended up at a Japanese airport saying he was from a totally unknown country called Taured. Now, some folks think it's proof of time travel, while others believe it's evidence he came from a different universe altogether. As much as you'd like to believe the story to be factual, the tricky part is this Torrid place. There's a reason you haven't heard of it. There's no Torrid to be found, whether in the present day or back in the 1950s when this supposed incident happened. After the airport incident, the man just vanished into thin air a day after arriving in Japan. Poof, gone forever. Let's rewind to that fateful day in July 1954 when the man from Torred supposedly landed in Tokyo. Descriptions paint him as a bearded, French-speaking man. Nothing too outlandish so far, right? Depending on who's telling the story, things start to diverge a bit. In one version, when the man hands over his passport to get stamped, the Japanese officer's eyes bulge out. While the passport looked legit, the country listed as Torrid isn't recognized by anyone, including the officer and other officials. Naturally, they take our Torrid visitor away for a little Q&A session. In another version, the man straight up tells the officer he's from Torrid and shows him the passport when he doesn't buy it. Our man from Torrid then started trying to convince the officers that his homeland is the real deal. According to him, Torrid sat snugly between France and Spain and would have been around for about 1,000 years. To prove his point, he even points to the area on a map that matches the Principality of Andorra. 
Obviously, things took a mysterious turn. The officers decided to hold the man in custody, suspecting he might be up to no good. They put him up in a nearby hotel for the night, but not without stationing two people outside his room to keep an eye on things. Can you guess what happens next? Drumroll, please. When the officers showed up the next morning, ready to continue their investigation, the man had vanished without a trace. No sign of escape, and to make matters even more puzzling, all his personal documents have magically vanished too. What if the man from Torrid was a time traveler, or an intergalactic adventurer? Some have even delved into the realms of science fiction to explain this bizarre event, and you won't believe the number of people on the internet who've latched onto it as evidence for alternate realities. One of the weirdest ideas suggests that the man accidentally stumbled into a parallel dimension and ended up at the Japanese airport. In that parallel universe, there's an Earth just like ours, but instead of Andorra, they call it Torrid over there. Another idea floating around was that the man was a time traveler from the future. Sorry to break it to you, but the most reasonable explanation for the whole story of the man from Tord is that someone's imagination went wild. Since there are many versions of the same story, it's probable people just kept adding outrageous details to the case, to make it more sensational. The whole story simply snowballed into an urban legend, and there's little to no reason to believe we've once seen a time traveler or intergalactic hitchhiker right here on Earth. It's been more than a year since the James Webb Telescope, which had taken over 20 years to complete, was launched. And for such a relatively short time, the ultra-modern and most powerful in history piece of equipment has already made plenty of discoveries. By observing the universe at infrared wavelength, James Webb lets us see things no other telescope has ever shown before. The primary goal of this incredible piece of equipment is to study the formation of galaxies and stars that appeared in the early universe. For example, look at the closest to us stellar nursery, a region of space where new stars get born. NASA has shared an image from James Webb that shows a small star-forming region. If you look at the picture attentively, you'll see jets bursting from infant stars. Around them, different colored clouds of cosmic dust are colliding with one another. The view is mesmerizing. The red dust consists of molecular hydrogen. You can also notice that some stars have something like shadows. Those hint at the creation of what will later become planets. At first sight, the image may seem chaotic, but astronomers claim that it's a relatively small and quiet stellar nursery in comparison to some others. Many young stars there are similar in size to our sun, or a bit smaller. The photo itself was taken with the help of Webb's near-infrared camera, NIRCAM. It's the observatory's primary camera that snaps images of the cosmos in two different infrared ranges. Another amazing discovery the Webb telescope has made is smoke molecules in a distant galaxy. It's the first time such molecules have been discovered so far away from our planet. The galaxy in question lies 12.3 billion light years away from Earth. It most likely formed about one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. Despite such a huge distance between the galaxy and our planet, scientists have managed to detect chemical compounds found in soot or smoke. And it's quite a big deal since it has pushed the record for detecting similar complex molecules back by around a billion years. This study has also confirmed the sheer power of the coolest piece of space equipment of all time. It managed to make this discovery despite the fact that the spectrometer needed for the measurements didn't perform to the fullest after having experienced a sudden and surprising degradation. The James Webb Telescope has also helped to boost our understanding of exoplanets. Those are planets orbiting stars other than our own sun. At the beginning of 2023, the observatory spotted its first exoplanet, LHS 475b. It's located 41 light years away from Earth and is approximately the same size as our planet. According to NASA, nowadays, James Webb is the only operating telescope capable of categorizing the atmosphere of Earth-sized exoplanets. The research team behind the discovery believes such results underline the precision of the telescope. They hope that it will help us locate many more rocky exoplanets that we might be able to colonize in the future. Even though, at first sight, it may seem that the universe is pretty empty, it's actually a very busy place. 
and Webb has all the necessary instruments to see all kinds of cosmic events happening out there. Just look at this image of WR-124. It's a star on the cusp of its explosive demise. In the image, the star is about to go supernova. It happens when a star runs out of its fuel and explodes at the end of its life cycle, releasing a giant cloud of space dust and hot gas into space. The star captured by the Webb telescope was at the wolf rayet stage of its life. That's a period when a star is shedding its outer layers before going supernova. The next amazing thing discovered by James Webb is a star-planet hybrid with very strange clouds. This bizarre world, VHS 1256b, is actually a brown dwarf. Those are bigger than planets but too small to classify as stars. They emit some light of their own and are quite hot. But their mass is simply not enough to fuse hydrogen into helium like full-fledged stars do. Space bodies of this kind aren't actually brown. They occur in a wide variety of colors, but those are mostly invisible to the human eye. What we can see is the light they emit, and to us, it appears to be dark orange or magenta. The brown dwarf discovered by the Webb telescope is almost 20 times the size of Jupiter. It orbits two red dwarf stars, and to complete one orbit, it needs over 10,000 years. Astronomers first found out about this unusual exoplanet in 2016, but at that time, they didn't classify it as a brown dwarf and, thus, couldn't explain its puzzling reddish glow. Now, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, they know the space object's origin. Anyway, back to those clouds. As you know, clouds on Earth are made of water vapor, but those on the brown dwarf are different. They seem to be made of... sand. It looks like good old sand from Earth, but it's actually not. The clouds are made of tiny particles of silicate. Another recent discovery involves several large galaxies that scientists believe were born not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. But the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted them. These galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them and estimated their age 5 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. It means that they came into being when our universe was very young, almost a baby. But the most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars dwelling there. The data received by the telescope don't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. It also doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. And here, James Webb has captured a distant region of space in unprecedented detail. This section of space is known as Pandora's Cluster. In the image, you can see three massive clusters of galaxies coming together and forming a mega cluster. The combined mass of these clusters acts as a powerful gravitational lens. And thanks to this natural magnification effect, scientists can see other galaxies in the region. Astronomers claim that the most recent image of Pandora's cluster is stronger and deeper than they have ever seen. James Webb has also managed to spot thousands of young stars never seen before in the Tarantula Nebula. This space formation got its nickname because of the appearance of dusty filaments spotted in previous images. It's the biggest star-forming region in the local group, which includes the galaxies nearest to the Milky Way. The Webb Telescope's images have helped to shed light on the composition of the Tarantula Nebula. The telescope has also detected protostars, infant stars in the process of gaining mass. Astronomers expect that these protostars will eventually form and shape the nebula further. Among other discoveries made by the James Webb Telescope, you can see the birth of 50 distant stars. Some of them power protoplanetary disks, which might later form solar systems light years away from our own. Here's one more image from James Webb. You can see a supermassive black hole that has a mass of 9 billion suns. It's so ginormous and ancient that scientists are struggling to explain its existence. Astronomers have also discovered a distant ring of dust, rock, and gas that contains a chemical called methylcation. It's known as a molecular building block of life, and it makes most of the organic material on our planet. James Webb helped researchers see powerful sandstorms on a planet 235 trillion miles away. Astronomers were happy to discover this treasure chest 
of countless tiny sand particles. Now look at this. Do you recognize this image? Those are the so-called pillars of creation. But this new view shows us just how star-speckled that dusty region actually is. You can compare the new photo with the one taken by Hubble in 2014. This is astonishing proof of scientific progress. Imagine a world where the red, barren landscape of Mars is transformed into a lush and verdant garden. A world where water flows freely, carving canyons and creating lakes and oceans. Can we achieve such a world by pouring the Earth's water onto the surface of Mars? And don't rush to say no, let's explore this possibility. All right, let's say we could magically transport all of the water on Earth to Mars. This supersized game of water pong would be crazy in both engineering and logistics. So how do we even do that? First of all, we're talking about millions and millions of gallons of water, which is no small feat. We would need some really big tanks to get all this water off the Earth. We would also have to figure out how to launch it all into space. This would require some serious rocket technology, as well as a lot of fuel. We could probably create an entire fleet of spacecraft specifically designed for the task. Just imagine that, a fleet of giant water tankers packed with tons of carefully harvested water blasting off from Earth's surface and hurtling through space at unimaginable speeds. Wouldn't that be a cool sight? Now, another way. Probably a better one would be to launch a large number of smaller missions over time, each carrying a smaller amount of water until enough of it has been transported to Mars. So, let's say we manage to do all that. What happens next? After we get to Mars, we'd need to distribute this water all across the planet. We could use a network of underground pipes or some special drones to transport the water to different locations. This is just some basic things, and as you can see, we already need a lot of planning and resources. Moreover, a crazy operation like this would require a massive coordinated effort from scientists, engineers, and space agencies all over the world. And let's not forget about the costs. No wonder that scientists don't really consider it a viable plan. But the scale of this operation isn't the only problem. Hypothetically, let's say that we figured all that out and poured the Earth's water on Mars. Now what? Well, believe it or not, it would be almost completely useless. Our main challenge will be the atmosphere and current climate of Mars. Mars is a dry desert with an atmosphere that's only about 1% as thick as Earth's. This means that any water poured onto the surface would quickly evaporate. It would be pretty hard to create a stable environment when the entire lake can go poosh in a matter of seconds. And if the water doesn't evaporate, then, on the contrary, it will turn into ice. Mars's surface temperature is well below freezing. Thin atmosphere only makes things worse. Another challenge is that Mars has a very weak magnetic field, which means it has little protection from the solar wind. Solar wind is a stream of charged particles that are constantly flowing out from the sun. These winds are pretty dangerous. They can strip away any water that's put on the Mars surface. Also, the solar radiation on Mars is much stronger than on Earth. This would make it even more difficult to maintain any liquid water there. And finally, don't forget that we also need to purify this water to remove all the bacteria before drinking it. But let's not give up. If we stay super optimistic, we can still try to solve these problems. Basically, we need to find a way to maintain liquid water in one place for a long time and make sure that it doesn't freeze or evaporate. So how do we do it? There are a few ways we can go about it. Number one, insulation. We could wrap all the water containers in insulation materials, like foam for example, or some reflective materials that can help to keep the water from freezing. Number two, heating. We could use various heaters and devices to keep the temperatures above freezing, even thermal blankets. Although this would require a lot of energy and would be a difficult task. Number three, underground reservoirs. We could dig a large hole and cover it with a transparent material to allow sunlight to pass through. This would help keep the water warm and insulated. Number four, salinity. 
Adding a small amount of salt or other dissolved minerals to water can lower its freezing point. Although we'll need much more salt for things like lakes, and this method isn't the most efficient. And finally, number five, building a greenhouse. We could build a greenhouse or some other structure that can trap heat and create a more earth-like environment. This option is probably the best one. After all, a greenhouse would also help us to grow various plants or other organisms. Yay, life! All right, great. Let's say we've discovered some way to store water on Mars and keep it there in a liquid, lukewarm state. What now? What impact would this have on Mars? Actually, this would be great. If we were to pour all this water on Mars, it could have drastically changed the climate of this cold, red desert. First of all, we could create a so-called greenhouse effect. It's when gases in a planet's atmosphere trap heat, causing the planet's temperature to rise. And yeah, this is pretty bad for Earth, but for Mars, whose temperatures jump between 70 and negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it would be awesome. This could cause the atmosphere to thicken and lead to the melting of the polar ice caps. Wouldn't that be awesome? Mars would begin to gradually turn from a lonely desert into Earth 2.0. It also means that the planet's atmosphere will change. For example, the weather patterns. Clouds could form on Mars, rains would begin to fall. And rains, as we know, transfer water from one region to another, which would mean they could water plants if they appeared on Mars. But all of this is pure speculation. We can't be completely sure what kind of impact pouring water on the Martian surface would have on the planet's climate. Perhaps, to create this greenhouse effect, we would need much more water than what we can transport. But if despite all these challenges, we had succeeded with our mission and made Mars much warmer and moist, could life have been finally born there? Um, unfortunately, that would still be pretty unlikely. Yes, water is very important for creating life, but that's not all we need. The composition of the Martian soil isn't very conducive to supporting life. The soil is mostly made of minerals called regolith, which are composed mainly of dust sand, and other materials that aren't very good for plants. Theoretically, we could terraform Mars. Terraforming is a gradual, slow change of the planet so that it becomes suitable for our life, but this would be a very complex, long, and costly process. Oh, and by the way, what would happen to our Earth after all that? We took quite a lot of water, didn't we? From Earth's perspective, transporting water to Mars would require an enormous amount of resources, including energy and different materials. And the amount of water we'd have to spend would be staggering. The loss of such a large amount of water from Earth's own reserves could have a significant impact on our planet, especially in areas where water is already scarce. So basically, this is a really bad idea, no matter how you look at it. Yeah, it may sound interesting, but it's not a viable plan at all. It would require too many resources, too much money, and it wouldn't even be worth it. That's why scientists and space agencies don't consider this idea seriously. Besides, there are many other more realistic and achievable goals in the field of Mars exploration. For example, we can keep studying the planet's geology, atmosphere, and potential for past or present life. These studies would help us to find some resources that could support future human exploration. Overall, we need to answer many more questions about Mars before we even begin to consider colonizing it. So let's keep an eye on scientific news and updates. In 2017, a strange object was spotted in our solar system. It had the shape of a long tube, similar to a pancake. No known asteroid or comet we've seen looks like that. Its exterior was also peculiar. It was at least 10 times more reflective than the average stuff that flies through space, with some saying it had a surface similar to polished metal. When it went past the Sun and left our reach, it accelerated faster than what our gravity could account for. At first glance, it was like this thing had a rocket strapped to its back. This unusual visitor even got a special name, a muamua. It comes from Hawaiian and translates to scout or visitor from a faraway land. And because of its characteristics, scientists soon began to wonder if this was, at last, a visit from otherworldly creatures. 
Before they went full on with the science fiction suppositions, astronomers gathered the information they were sure about, starting with the fact that Oumuamua must have come from another solar system. There must have been some unfortunate event in its home system that led to its ejection. What they didn't know was that this was a comet or asteroid. They're both celestial objects orbiting a sun, but they have distinct compositions and behaviors. Comets are composed primarily of ice, dust, and rocky material, often referred to as dirty snowballs. When a comet approaches the sun, the heat causes the ice to vaporize, releasing gas and dust particles into space. This creates a bright glowing tail that can extend for millions of miles. Comets generally have elliptical orbits, often taking them from the distant reaches of our solar system closer to the sun. Asteroids, however, are mostly made of rock and metal. In our neighborhood, they are remnants of the early formation of the solar system and are typically found in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Unlike comets, asteroids do not develop tails when they approach the Sun, as they have no ice. Their orbits generally follow more circular paths compared to comets. By all accounts, Oumuamua should be a comet, because it seems to come from a different location in the universe. Yet, it doesn't exhibit the typical signs of cometary activity. Oumuamua lacks a tail and does not spew out gas as it passes by, not like me. Even though it behaves like a comet, it looks more like an asteroid. Now, another big question is how scientists even managed to spot Oumuamua in the first place. Considering the vastness of space and time in the galaxy, it's remarkable. Stars have lifetimes spanning millions or billions of years, and the formation of a solar system takes hundreds of millions of years. Even the fastest objects take tens of thousands of years to travel from one star to another. In contrast, humans have only been observing the skies with telescopes for around 400 years, a tiny fraction of cosmic time. And it's only in recent decades, even years, that we've had the technology to detect and track fast-moving, dim objects. Either rocks like these are abundant, or we've been incredibly lucky with our detections. Or it's simply wanted to be seen. Now, another question that was asked was where such objects could come from. It's highly unlikely that Oumuamua came from a mature, stable solar system. That's because such systems don't eject enough material to fill up the galaxy. Occasionally, a random rock might get flung out, but it can rarely travel so far. Young systems, however, act differently. In these chaotic environments, collisions, mergers, and migrations are happening everywhere. Plenty of tiny rocks roam around, perfect candidates for ejection. The solar system that kicked Oumuamua out must have had a planet similar to Jupiter. Its massive size and gravity could influence other objects in the system, causing potential ejections. But not all solar systems develop Jupiter-sized planets. Often, massive planets end up close to their stars, becoming hotter versions of Jupiter. These planets, snugly orbiting a sun, are less likely to eject debris. Now, Neptune-like planets may play a role too. While not as massive as Jupiter, they tend to call the outer regions of solar systems their home. Our solar system has the Kuiper Belt, a reservoir of comets in its outer reaches. During a solar system's early stages, interactions between Neptune-like planets and debris are common. Finding Neptune-like planets in other systems has been challenging, though. Our methods for detecting exoplanets work better for massive objects close to their stars, making it difficult to spot Neptune counterparts farther out. Oumuamua was also linked to a peculiar theory about how life came to be in the universe – panspermia. Now that's a hypothesis that suggests that life exists throughout the universe and can be distributed between planets by various means such as asteroids, comets, or even spacecraft. It says that life must have originated in one location in the universe and then spread to other celestial bodies. Fans of the panspermia theory have suggested that such interstellar objects could potentially carry tiny microbes, those building blocks of life between star systems. If such objects were to impact a planet or a moon, they could transfer these materials and seed the celestial body with life. 
For now, there is no evidence to support the theory that this comet in particular has transported life between star systems. After years of research, the overall consensus became that Oumuamua was indeed a comet. The reason why it moves so strangely is because it might have frozen hydrogen on its surface that reacts when touched by sunlight. The closer it got to our sun, the faster it became, releasing that hydrogen and also changing its path to our solar system. Its color also supports this theory. It's red, which might mean it's been hit by cosmic rays for a long time. The longer it was touched by those rays, the more hydrogen it gathered in the process. But since they can't be completely sure, astronomers have a plan to follow this visitor. One idea is to send a mission to check it out. It's already far away from us, but it may not be too late just yet. We may be able to send a probe fast enough to catch up with the comet. The plan was named Project Lyra and aims to use the Earth's orbit and that of Jupiter to bounce out a probe far enough to reach Oumuamua. If it works, it will be the fastest space device we've sent out in the universe. One potential trajectory of the space probe involves the gravitational pull of our planet and that of Jupiter as a lasso effect, but not Ted Lasso. The probe will leave our planet and re-enter Earth's orbit before sending it to meet with Jupiter's pull. It will be sent back near our planet a second time, where it will be ejected with enough force to reach the comet. Project Lyra also aims to follow a second faraway visitor named Borisov. This one was discovered by an amateur astronomer and now bears his name. What's interesting about it is that it's, well, spotless. Similar to our experience with Oumuamua, we haven't seen anything like Borisov before either. Studies of the light coming from its cloud of dust and gas show it's very clean compared to other space objects. After it was first noticed in August 2019, Astronomers studied its path through our solar system and concluded it came from another star too. But Borisov gave us more time to study it because we spotted it earlier in its journey through our neighborhood. Researchers used advanced telescopes to look at the dust coming off Borisov. They found it's throwing off over 400 pounds of dust every second. They also found Borisov has more carbon monoxide than comets from our solar system usually do. But the amount isn't the same everywhere on the comet. This tells us the space object probably started forming near its home star before moving away, maybe because of larger planets in its system. The light from Borisov is way more polarized than light from other comets we've seen, and its cloud is super smooth. This tells us Borisov has never interacted with another star. So, we might be getting closer to finding a massive icy planet beyond Neptune's orbit. Yeah, sorry Pluto, still not you. Recently, some universe mapping using data from a telescope in Hawaii eliminated about 78% of the possible locations for this mysterious Waldo from space. Some people call it Planet 9, while others prefer Planet X. Either way, it's been causing controversy since its existence was first proposed. And that is mainly because no study so far can answer the big question – does it really exist? If discovered, Planet 9 would rank as the fifth largest planet in our solar system, with a mass 10 times that of Earth. It's also theorized to be gaseous, like Uranus. The initial study on Planet 9, dating back to 2016, suggests that this colossal new planet orbits the Sun 29 times farther out than Neptune which sits at about 2.8 billion miles. As a result, the planet 9 would take between 10,000 and 20,000 years to complete a single orbit around the Sun. If confirmed, this yet-to-be-understood world would dominate a region larger than any other known planet in our cosmic neighborhood. These are all intriguing hypotheses, but without a single piece of evidence or observation to back them up. Before dismissing this as a wild guess, it is important to note that these researchers relied on complex mathematical modeling and computer simulations to speculate about the planet's characteristics, because that's what they do. The hypothetical presence of this planet would explain various mysterious features located beyond Neptune. We are specifically talking about the Kuiper Belt. 
a huge donut-shaped region filled with icy debris left over from the formation of the solar system, including comets and dwarf planets like Pluto. What happens is that the six farthest objects in the Kuiper belt exhibit elliptical orbits that are all oriented in a similar direction within physical space and tilted approximately 30 degrees downward relative to the orbital plane of our eight known planets. What's strange here is that, despite their distinct orbital velocities around the solar system, they maintain this alignment. The likelihood of such alignment occurring randomly is extremely low, around 0.007%. So here comes Planet 9, a hypothetical massive celestial body that offers a plausible explanation for this strange phenomenon, potentially exerting gravitational influence to shape these orbits. The initial theory didn't hold up for long, facing accusations of observational bias and calculation errors. Then, in 2017, another study popped up, sparking back the idea that maybe Planet 9 is out there after all. This time, Spanish astronomers tried a novel approach, focusing on observing extreme trans-Neptunian objects. These celestial bodies orbit the Sun in highly stretched elliptical paths with average distances exceeding 13 billion miles. The research suggests that the distances between these objects' nodes and the Sun might provide clues to Planet 9's location. You see, these nodes are the points where a celestial body's orbit intersects the solar system's plane. When these objects reach these points, they're more likely to interact with other solar system bodies, potentially causing significant changes in their orbits or even collisions. So, if the trajectory of these extreme trans-Neptunian objects remains stable, everything's fine. But if it's not, well, that's a sign that something else, something big, is messing with their path. And that's exactly what the research found. There is something unseen out there, throwing these objects off course. And that something could be a planet chilling at a distance between 300 to 400 times farther from the Sun than Earth. To this day, the study of the extreme trans-Neptunian objects is the strongest evidence we've got for Planet 9's existence. And if you're still not convinced by this theory, know that strange motions like these have led to planetary discoveries before. Neptune, for instance, was spotted because Uranus's motion didn't quite agree with the predictions of Newtonian gravity. But the deflection of its orbit could be explained if it was caused by a pull of an undiscovered planet. And just like that, we discovered Neptune. Now, the year is 2021, and there's all this buzz about Planet 9 again. After correcting some old guesses, studies are now leaning towards the idea that this mystery world follows an epic loop around the Sun every 7,000 years. That is massive news, because it means this planet might be closer than we ever thought, making it easier for our telescopes to spot it. The paper also suggests there is a whopping 99% chance that the funky orbits of these distant objects are all because of this unseen planet, not just some cosmic coincidence. Now, the odds of this whole situation being a fluke are down to a 1 in 250 chance, which is much better than the 1 in 10,000 chance back in 2016. All these optimistic numbers have brought us to where we are today keeping our hopes and working on better equipment to continue the mission of spotting Planet 9. As mentioned earlier, researchers in Hawaii created some kind of treasure map utilizing the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System to eliminate 78% of its locations. This is great news, considering how challenging it is to find a planet-sized needle in a cosmic haystack. But unfortunately, Planet 9's presence remains a ghost in the dark outer reaches of our solar system. Enthusiasts are still convinced of its existence and believe it is only a matter of time before we celebrate the discovery of Earth's new cosmic cousin. They're putting their hopes on the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which is currently under construction in Chile and is scheduled to begin science operations in late 2025. Over the course of 10 years, this observatory will scan the entire southern hemisphere sky every few nights with a 27-foot, fast-moving telescope equipped with the largest digital camera in the world. The idea is to catalog everything in the solar system, 
reaching out to and beyond Neptune and tracking the movements of millions of celestial objects, including space junk, asteroids, comets, and stars. If Planet 9 is indeed out there, this next-generation telescope could be the one to find it. The existence of this mysterious planet is far from being universally accepted in the scientific community. That is simply because Planet 9 isn't the only explanation for the strange phenomenon occurring beyond Neptune. One theory suggests that a group of distant objects, such as dwarf planets, comets, and moons, might be collectively influencing the orbits of the extreme trans-Neptunian objects. Others believe that a black hole is behind all this. These compressed masses are some of the densest objects in the universe, potentially capable of affecting the orbits of other masses, like how this supposed ghost planet 9 is believed to be doing. Another bold perspective suggests that our current understanding of the laws of gravity is flawed, actually incomplete. This theory, known as modified Newtonian dynamics, proposes that these distant icy objects exhibit strange behavior not due to influence from another planet, but rather because the immense gravitational field of the Milky Way is influencing them. However, even supporters of this theory acknowledge that it is too early to draw firm conclusions, and much more extensive research is still required. While we continue our relentless hunt for Planet 9, some astronomers have taken it a step further, suggesting the existence of a hypothetical Planet 10. This world has a mass and size like that of Mars or Earth and is located on the edges of the Kuiper Belt. But the thing is, if this alleged Planet 10 is indeed as small as scientists believe, it might not have enough gravity to clear its orbit of debris. And that is pretty similar to what happens with Pluto, being one of the reasons why it got into trouble back in 2006. So yeah, it's better not to get too excited. This supposed Planet 10 might end up classified as another dwarf planet. Earth's magnetic field hides a fascinating story. It turns out that it's getting weaker day by day. In fact, it's been doing so for the last 3,000 years. And if this trend continues, we could be in for some trouble within a millennium. What's the big deal? Well, picture this. Magnetic north becomes south, and vice versa. Pretty wild, right? When this happens, our planet's protective magnetic shield might weaken allowing more cosmic rays to hit us. These high-energy particles from the universe can cause electronic malfunctions in our satellites and produce elements that could be harmful to us. The last time a polarity reversal occurred was between 772,000 and 774,000 years ago. Thankfully, humanity has some pretty smart people on the case who are investigating the history of Earth's magnetic field. They take cores of sediments from the seafloor and study the magnetization of fossils to figure out when these reversals occurred in the past and when they might happen again. Another group of researchers is studying the South Atlantic Anomaly (SAA), a vast region of Earth's magnetic field that is about three times weaker than the field at the poles. Using data from multiple satellites, they are trying to figure out what's causing the SAA and how it might change in the future. This could give us a glimpse into how a weakened magnetic field can affect our satellites and our planet. Sure, our generation won't be here to witness these changes, but it does make you wonder what that planet might look like upside down. Magnetically, that is. NASA's astronomers have also announced that in 4 billion years, the Milky Way galaxy is going to get a major glow-up. After a cosmic collision that will shake things up, I'm not talking about a small fender bender here, I'm talking about a titanic collision with our neighboring Andromeda galaxy. Humanity will have to hold on to its space helmet for this one because the sun might get flung into a new region of the galaxy. However, our Earth and solar system probably won't be seriously affected. Sounds difficult to believe, so how come? NASA's Hubble Space Telescope did some hardcore measurements of Andromeda's motion. 
Although the galaxies will plow into each other, the stars inside each galaxy are so far apart that they won't collide with other stars during the encounter. However, the stars will be thrown into different orbits around their new galactic centers. According to simulations, our solar system will probably be tossed much farther from the galactic core than it is today. Set your telescopes aside, you don't need to start counting down the years. This event is likely scheduled in about 4 billion years, so chances for us to witness it are zero. Saturn is losing its rings. Thankfully, we won't be here to witness this sad event either. Apparently, the rings are being pulled into Saturn as a dusty rain of ice particles, all under the influence of Saturn's magnetic field. According to NASA's research, the ring rain is draining an amount of water products that could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool from Saturn's rings every half an hour. The entire ring system will likely be gone in 300 million years. Scientists believe we should consider ourselves lucky to witness Saturn's ring system at all, as it seems to be in the middle of its lifetime. But if you think about it that way, that rings around planets are all temporary, there's a chance we've just missed out on the giant ring system of Jupiter, or those of Uranus and Neptune. These planets have only thin ringlets around them these days. Scientists have long debated whether Saturn was formed together with its rings or if the planet acquired them later in life. The new research favors the second scenario indicating that they are unlikely to be older than 100 million years, while Saturn itself is around 4.5 billion years old. What caused the rings to appear in the first place? Well, there are a few theories. One of them suggests